Right, coming in at number 10, we have The Haunted Oprah Winfrey Show. What? The Oprah Winfrey Show is famously filmed in the Windy City, near the spot of one of the worst boating disasters of all time. Now, this resulted in the largest loss of life from an incident in the Great Lakes. In 1915, passengers were boarding the SS Eastland, which was docked in the Chicago River. Workers from Hawthorne Works were off to a picnic. It was a full boat, and this caused weight distribution issues, and then the boat listed to one side rolling. This trapped some passengers below decks, others were crushed by heavy furniture. 844 passengers and four crew members died in the disaster. The dead were taken to a nearby armory building, which served as an impromptu morgue. Fast forward decades, and this building is now a warehouse and a film studio where the Oprah Winfrey show is filmed. Many members of the show's crew have reported seeing and hearing strange things in the building. There have been reports of screams from the doomed passengers, and even some apparitions sightings. The most frequently spotted ghost is the Grey Lady, who is often seen stalking the halls. Coming in at number 9, there are 12,000 corpses underneath Lincoln Park. Parks! Gotta love them! Green spaces, picnics, lemonade, a few cheeky beers, some banter, frisbee, fun times, and thousands of dead people. Wait, what? Yep, that's right, rumour has it that Lincoln Park is built on an old cemetery, and surprisingly, this urban legend is true. Between 1843 and 1865, there were four different cemeteries in the spot where the public park now is. The city was eyeing up a spot for the park, and after the fire of 1871, they had the perfect excuse to start again. While some bodies were exhumed and moved, around 12,000 remained under the park. When the zoo was built in 1962, bodies were unearthed and reburied. With that many bodies, is there any surprise that there have been a number of ghost sightings in the area? Coming in at number 8, we have the legend of Mrs. O'Leary and the fire that killed 300 people. The Great Fire of Chicago is one of the most horrendous things that happened to the city. 3.3 square miles of city burnt from the 8th to the 10th of October 1871. This also left hundreds of thousands of people without homes. The popular legend blames Mrs. O'Leary, you know the song, late last night, before she went to bed, Mrs. O'Leary, she hung a lantern in her shed and then the cow, he kicked it over and he winked at her and said, it'll be a hot time in the old town tonight, right? You know the score, basically. We all know the score. I'm from England and I know the score. Now the problem is, poor old Mrs. Leary never actually did it. She was a poor Irish Catholic immigrant and was made a scapegoat because of Protestant founders of the US being distrustful of Catholics. Also, there was a lot of anti-Irish racism around the time. Reported by Michael Aaron of the Chicago Tribune, he actually was to blame for fanning the flames on Mrs. O'Leary's reputation. But it was already destroyed because people across the world are still singing songs about it today. She was was pardoned by Chicago City Council in 1997, as was the cow, but of course it was far too late for them. Nonetheless, the legend lives on today. Continuing with the Great Fire of Chicago, we have the haunted water tower at number 7. In the fire, legend has it that one brave citizen pumped water from the iconic Chicago water tower to try and help quell the flames. The water tower on Streeterville survived the blaze as a result of the man's actions. He proved himself a hero as he manned the pump instead of fleeing for his life. Then, as the metal structure got hotter and hotter, the flames rose around him. The man knew he was going to die. Rather than die slowly and painfully, the legend has it that he hung himself from this structure. Legend also has it that sometimes people still see his body hanging through towers upstairs. This has been confirmed by a police officer who saw his body hanging through a window, but then when he went to investigate, there was no one there. Coming in at number 6, we have the Devil of Hull House. Is this the real life story behind Rosemary's Baby? The story spawned the popular movie, and this could actually be the true life explanation. The Hull House was a focal spot in the Chicago community. Jane Addams took the building over in the late 1800s and ran it as a woman's shelter. Jane reportedly took in a woman who was heavily pregnant and whose husband and had abandoned her. It seems the midwives in Jane's employ would not go near the child after it was born. Why? Because it had a monstrous appearance. The legend states that the baby was born a monster because his father yelled to the heavens in frustration of being given only daughters. He reportedly yelled, I would rather have the devil in this house than have another daughter. What a man. 
Jane kept that baby a secret, but one day, three Italian women burst into the house and demanded to see the devil baby. They said they knew a baby had been born with pointed ears, a tail, and cloven hooves. The woman caused such a fuss and would not leave until forcibly removed. Then, the locals started talking. Soon a crowd appeared at the house and people wanted to get a look at the child. The mystery was never resolved, but there have been many whispers of hauntings at the house. Some people report seeing the devil's face at the window of the house to this day. Coming into number 5, we have the legend of Homie the Clown. Homie the Clown is a classic Chicago urban legend and long predates the creepy clown sightings of 2016. In 1991, there were a slew of reports about a creepy clown cruising the streets trying to lure kids into a red and white blue van with ha ha written on the side. The clown was dressed as a TV character called Homie and was said to be offering up candy and money to children who would come with him. The police had a lot of reported sightings, mainly from children. They dismissed a report from two 10-year-old boys in Oak Park, suggesting that the kids had banded together to troll the police. Nonetheless, this didn't quell the rumors, and a whole epidemic of sightings sprung up over the city. The clown, however, has never been caught. A lot of kids around the 90s in Chicago will remember Homie. Coming into number three, we have the knocking ghosts of Flight 191. On the 25th of May, 1979, American Airlines Flight 191 crashed moments after takeoff from Chicago's O'Hare International Airport. 258 passengers and 13 crew were killed, as were two people on the ground. This insane death toll makes it the worst aviation accident in the United States history. Just as the jet was beginning its takeoff rotation, the left engine separated from the left wing and smashed into the runway, severing hydraulic fluid lines. As the plane began to climb, the damaged left side of the plane produced less lift and caused the plane to roll. This then made the plane crash into an open field by the airport, killing everyone on board. Now the pictures from the aftermath are truly harrowing indeed. Debris was hurled into nearby trailer parks, which destroyed five trailers, but that wasn't all the trailer park would see of the crash. As the years went on, people living at the trailer park have reported frantic knocks at their door, only to open them and find that there's nobody there. One resident reported coming across a worried man who claimed he needed to make a connection. Another man in the area was walking his dog when he came across a man in a suit that smelled of gasoline. He told him that he needed to make an emergency call. Coming into number two, we have the Italian Bride. Mount Carmel Cemetery is best known for being the final resting place of Al Capone and a number of his gangster cronies. Also resident in the cemetery is the much famed and deeply mysterious Italian Bride. The bride wasn't actually a bride at all. She was a young woman named Julia Bacola. Unfortunately, she died aged 29 in childbirth in 1921. Now, she was reportedly buried in her wedding dress, which sparked her urban legend name. Following her death, her mother had a string of wild and vivid dreams that her daughter was not dead. Julia would tell her that she was alive and she needed her help. She had to come to the cemetery and save her. Finally, six years after her daughter's death, the dreams got too much for Julia's mother, who had her daughter's body exhumed. When the casket was opened, Julia's body had not decayed one bit since the day she was buried. Creepily, on her gravestone, there's a picture of her body after she was exhumed, and yeah, she does look pretty freshly dead, which really sometimes is the best a gal can hope for. Finally, coming into number one, we have one of the most popular Chicago urban legends of all time. We have the story of Resurrection Mary. Ah, the vanishing hitchhiker. This urban legend is pinpointed to the southwest of Chicago in Justice, Illinois. Since the 1930s, around 30 men who have been driving along Archer Avenue between Resurrection Cemetery and Willowbrook Ballroom have reported being hailed over by a young, blonde-haired, blue-eyed woman in a party dress. Further reports say that she is wearing dancing shoes, a shawl, and holding a small clutch bag. The men that have stopped for her and let her in their car have said that she's softly spoken and shy. The woman asks to be dropped off at Resurrection Cemetery, and then she disappears in front of the gates. The legend says that this girl was in the ballroom with her boyfriend in the 1930s, but they got into an argument and she decided to walk home. Sadly, as she was walking up Archer Avenue, she was hit by a car that then sped away. Left for dead, she unfortunately died at the scene, but her spirit is still searching for a chivalrous man to drive her home. Other reports have involved drifters breaking suddenly when they see a woman in white in the middle of the road. All right, so starting off at our 10th spot, we have the Phantom Kangaroo. Okay, I know it doesn't sound too scary, like 
a cute little kangaroo. How could it be scary? Well, this one definitely is. So people have described this kangaroo as being 3.5 to 5.5 feet tall, with glowing eyes and supernatural powers. It is said that it can vanish into thin air and can brutally murder local animals. Now, people have claimed to see this phantom kangaroo all throughout Minnesota, but the most recorded sightings were in Coon Rapids. People have said that they have seen this creature rummaging through their trash or even killing pets. People who have seen it have called it a big bunny, but then they would get scared when it disappeared right in front of their eyes. Coming in at number 9, we have the Dogman. This is another creature that has been reported in different regions of Minnesota. So in 2009, a man encountered this cryptid. He was driving along a country road when he spotted some deer. He pulled over and was watching the deer when he spotted what he referred to as a Dogman. He said that this creature was 7 feet tall, two-legged, and had big, long hands with opposable thumbs. He also said that this creature had a long snout with broad shoulders and muscular thighs. He was covered in dark brown fur. So maybe werewolves are real and this is a version of one. What do you think? Now, thankfully, this creature did not attack this man. They made eye contact and as soon as they did, the man drove away. Smart thinking. In our eighth spot, we have Peppy the Lake Monster. Now, this lake monster is thought to be similar to Nessie the Loch Ness Monster. In fact, uh, maybe they're related, who knows? Well, Peppy is a massive snake-like creature with a long neck who lives in Lake Pepin. There have been various sightings throughout the 18th and 1900s. People who have seen it have said that it looks like something between the size of an elephant and a rhino and has smooth gray skin. They also said that it can snatch a flying bird right out of the air. Now, Peppy has been considered harmless as there have been no reports of it causing any harm to citizens. In fact, some individuals have gone diving in hopes to see this creature. There is currently a $50,000 reward for anyone who can prove that Peppy is indeed real. So uh, time to put those Photoshop skills to the test. Or maybe it is real and just he's gone into hiding or something. Moving on, at number 7 we have the hairy man of Virgus Trail. Maybe you should think twice before going on a nice little hike in Minnesota. So apparently there have been sightings of a giant hairy man type creature lurking this trail. This creature is supposed to be 8 feet tall with a musty odor. Honestly, I don't know who got close enough to smell this creature. I feel like if it approached me, smelling it would be the last thing on my mind. This creature is also supposed to be very aggressive. A man by the name of Kan Zitzau apparently encountered this creature while driving in the woods. He claimed that this creature jumped on his car and started smashing the hood. Apparently, there are also reports of brutal animal attackings from this creature. So what do you think? You down to come hiking with me? In our sixth spot, we have the Nopeming Sanitarium. Seriously, the name of this place literally has nope in it. If that's not a hint to not go there, then I don't know what is. Now, when people hear the word sanitarium, they often associate it with an insane asylum. However, this was not the case. The Nopemic Sanitarium was a home for the ill and elderly. In 1912, it was home to thousands of patients with tuberculosis. Many of them died, and as a result, people claimed that their spirits still roam the halls. Apparently, if you go there, then you can hear some of the spirits of people moaning in pain. Now, this legend also states that there is a nine-year-old girl that lurks around the sanitarium. People don't know who this girl is, but there have been reports of people hearing her giggle, or even of her appearing in photographs that they have taken of the empty hallways. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with Bertha Maynard. Now, legend states that Bertha was accused of being a witch in the late 1800s. It is now said that she haunts her grave site. People have reported seeing her apparition near her grave or even hearing her whispers and cries. They even claim that her grave would move around or that her headstone would just disappear. Now, one individual reported his encounter with a ghost. He said that he was just chilling in his car with his lady friend by the grave. He states that out of nowhere, his radio went all staticky and the car's antenna started moving rapidly, despite there being no wind. He believes that Bertha was trying to communicate with him. The legend also describes an event involving some teen kids in Bertha's grave. Apparently, these kids vandalized her headstone, and shortly after, one of the kids' parents passed away unexpectedly. They believed that this was Bertha's revenge. Coming in at number four, we have the ghost clown. Now, what's scarier than a clown? 
a ghost clown. So apparently this ghost clown can be seen along the trail of Lake Almagna. There you go, another reason why we just shouldn't go hiking. Legend has it that this clown just stands and stares at you as you walk the trail. Legend has it that he doesn't want you walking this trail, so he will stalk and stare at you until you leave. They also claim to have seen this clown's apparition appear and then disappear randomly, or have even seen weird shadowy figures darting in and out of the trees. But my question is, who is this ghost clown man? What happened in the forest and why is the ghost dressed like a clown? Or maybe Pennywise has found a new hiding spot. Who knows? In our third spot, we have Duluth's East Little Theater. This next urban legend is quite an interesting one. Now, apparently a drama director died in this theater after falling off the balcony. Before his death, he was in the midst of writing a play. However, because of this accident, he was never able to finish it. Now, legend has it that one day his script mysteriously appeared on an English teacher's desk. Attached to the script was a note written on an old stationery that read, please perform this and then it was signed by him with the initials RC. Now, they never did end up performing this piece, for obvious reasons, I mean, that must have been terrifying, but drama students say that they hear weird noises in the theater and sometimes feel a cold presence. Coming in at number two, we have the Wendigo. Now, apparently the Wendigo has been seen in forests of colder regions like Minnesota and Canada. Dang it, why does it have to be in Canada too? So the Wendigo is a giant creature that can be up to 15 feet tall. They are skinny and often have antlers coming out of their head. Now, there have been several reports of this creature being seen in forests all throughout Minnesota. People believe that this creature evolved from a lost hunter. They claim that his hunger and the extreme cold weather drove him to cannibalism. Wendigos are then said to hunt down and eat humans. Wendigos look terrifying. Like imagine being a hunter and seeing the antlers from behind a tree and hoping you're going to catch a deer and then next thing you know it's this gigantic creature hunting you. Spooky. No thank you. And in our number one spot, we have the UFO attacks. So there are UFO sightings in every city, basically. Anything in the sky that looks a bit odd is automatically claimed as a UFO and people believe it too even if it was reported by old Mr. Jenkins who wasn't even wearing his glasses. So in August of 1979, a deputy by the name of Val Johnson suffered an attack from what he claims was a UFO. So this deputy was in the Marshall County when he saw a strange light on the road ahead of him. He drove towards the light when all of a sudden it completely filled his car and blinded him. Half an hour later, he woke up in a ditch. He had welder burns on his eyes and the time on his wristwatch and dashboard clock was off. His car had a smashed head light and his antenna was bent. Police have no explanation as to what happened. And since then, this has become a well-known urban legend. Let me know what you think of this one in the comments below. Do you believe in aliens? Hmm? Starting off at number 10 now, we have the Blue Flame Ghost. The story goes that in the 1930s, a woman lived in Ohio's Sugar Grove. She was young, happy, and liked by everyone. She fell for a young man who had a terrible temper, and the couple were often seen arguing in the town. Over time, the locals noticed her changing. She never smiled anymore and began to grow cold and weary. One night, the couple were parked beside a bridge when, naturally, an argument broke out. This time, it was worse than usual, though. In a fit of anger, the young woman pulled out a knife and stabbed her fiance Beyonce's throat. She kept slashing until his head came off. She herself was bleeding from the struggle. She staggered out of the car and back down the hill, carrying her fiance's head. She eventually collapsed and died at the bottom of the hill, where she was found by locals the next day. Since then, the old bridge has been replaced by a new concrete one. However, some still say that on certain nights, if you stand on the bridge and call out the woman's name, her glowing blue spirit will appear at the top of the hill and move towards you. What you do at that point is honestly up to you, but given the vengeful state in which she died, most people don't stick around. Next up at number 8 now, we have Brubaker Bridge. According to legend, in the 1930s there was a brutal one car accident on this bridge over Sam's Run Creek, Butler County. The bridge is in a very rural area and nobody actually discovered the crash victims until later that night when a local farmer passed by. The farmer went to get help and a total of 12 bodies were recovered. They were eventually identified and given proper burials. That wasn't the end of things 
things though. Shortly after, the farmer who originally discovered the bodies claimed that while crossing the bridge one night after, his car suddenly cut out. He said that he heard 13 knocks on his car, then a hissing noise before suddenly the car just came back to life. Locals say that this is the spirit of the 13th victim whose body was never recovered. The spirit is still said to haunt those who pass over the bridge, hoping they will be the ones to finally find its body and give them a proper burial so that they may pass on peacefully. Next up at number 7 now we have Stony Creek Cemetery. The story goes like this. In 1825, the local caretaker in Stony Creek Cemetery in Adams County made a discovery. At the bottom of a large tree was the body of a young man. It didn't take much to figure out the cause of death as the man's head was completely missing. Although it's hard to beat that in terms of strangeness, there was one other thing. The crime scene was clean of any blood around this headless body. The police determined the murder must have taken place somewhere else before the perpetrator then dumped the body in the cemetery. Rumours began to spread that the head had not been cut off but rather ripped off by something extremely powerful. The case remained open and unsolved for many years before entering books of folklore. There are those that say that some nights a misty figure appears under a tree in the cemetery, the ghost of this unidentified man, unable to find peace until his murder is solved. Moving on to number 6 now guys, we have Patterson Tower. There are a number of theories about the origin of this strange tower thought to be built by a John D. Patterson many years ago. According to legend, a group of teenagers in the 1960s took refuge in the tower during a thunderstorm. As the storm raged on, a lightning bolt hit the top of the tower. Electricity surged down the metal stair rail and electrocuted two of the teenagers, killing them almost instantly. They say that in the weeks afterwards, you could still see their charred outlines on the tower wall. Officials blocked off the tower from dark tourists by placing metal plates across the door. Visitors still just ripped them off though to see what was inside. Legend now says that on stormy nights, the shadowy spirits of the teenagers who died can be seen in the tower. A bright bolt of lightning will illuminate their ghosts, making them glow as if they had just been hit by lightning. When the storm fades, so do they. Until the next time. Coming at number 5 now, we have Little Sugar Creek. The town of Bellbrook is sometimes referred to as Ohio's Sleepy Hollow because of all the ghostly legends that originated there. A man called James Buckley ran a sawmill there many years ago. He lived in a small cabin and grew his business to great heights, becoming the wealthiest man in the town. One night, his newfound wealth attracted some robbers. When authorities finally arrived to help him, they found Buckley's headless body outside. The murder was never solved. People say the cabin was haunted then by his spirit. Those who ventured there say they've been confronted by a headless ghost, his arms outstretched as if begging for help. In time, the sawmill was demolished, but that didn't bring an end to the sightings. Locals still say that if you wander down to Little Sugar Creek, where the sawmill once stood, you can still see the ghost of James Buckley, unable to pass on peacefully while the case of his brutal murder has been left cold. Moving on to number 4 now, we have Otterbein Cemetery. This one is also known as Blood bloody horseshoe grave. During the 1840s, an Ohioan called James Henry was involved with two women at the same time, Rachel Hodge and Mary Angle. He wanted to know which one to marry. One night while riding home, he fell asleep on his horse. He awoke to find his horse had not taken him home, but had instead stopped in front of Mary Angle's house. He took this as a sign, and soon he and Mary were married. As his wedding gift to her, he gave her the horse that brought them together. They lived happily, but in 1840s, Mary died from one of the many prevalent diseases at the time. She was buried in Otterbein Cemetery. Henry began courting Rachel Hodge, and eventually the two were married. He gave her the same horse as a wedding gift. They hadn't been married long before locals noticed something strange about Mary's tombstone. There was a glowing outline of a horseshoe on it. James took this as a sign that Mary was displeased with his new marriage. They said he was cursed. One night, witnesses heard strange noises and lights coming from the cemetery. The next Next morning, James was found dead in his barn with the mark of a horseshoe on his forehead. His death was ruled an accident, as Henry had been alone in the barn at the time. All alone, except for one other creature 
a horse. Even today, they say a strange horseshoe mark is still visible on Mary's tombstone, and that on some nights you can hear the sound of hooves trotting up the cemetery road. Moving on to number three now, we have Buxton Inn. This place has been going since 1812, making it one of the oldest inns in Ohio. In the mid 1800s, Major Buxton, after whom the inn was named, took control of the inn. There have been reports of ghosts there ever since. Many of the ghosts alleged to haunt the inn are said to be of previous owners. However, there's also strange knockings people have heard coming from the basement where the stagecoach drivers would have stayed. The door to that same basement is known to open and close by itself, and there have even been reports of footsteps coming up and down the stairs there. Major Buxton's spirit is said to be a shadowy figure, often sighted in the dining room. Another owner, Orin Granger, appears as an elderly woman wearing old-fashioned breeches who is said to steal pies from the kitchen. There's also the Lady in Blue, who died in the inn and is recognisable by her distinct perfume. There's even a phantom cat that enters people's rooms at night in much the same way it did when it was alive. Next up at number two now, we have Old Raridan. The story goes that as European settlers first began to arrive in the Ohio Valley, wolf attacks on livestock became more and more frequent. Farmers began to hunt down the wolves, possibly to the point of extinction, but none of them could have predicted what came next. One wolf in particular always managed to escape the farmers. A huge grey one became known as Old Raridan. Farmers often reported seeing him and his mate wandering through the woods, but they never could corner him. Eventually, they became the only wolves that remained. One night, the wolves were trapped with their backs against Big Rock, a famous landmark. The hunters opened fire and brought the female down. Just as the hunters set their dogs loose to finish her off, a loud cry echoed through the woods. Old Raridan leapt in front and fought the dogs off. The hunters opened fire and wounded him too. Eventually, they called off their dogs. Old Raridan dragged his now dead mate up to the top of Big Rock. Once there, he let out a thunderous howl across the backdrop of the moon and then slumped down beside his mate. All was quiet, but not forever. On certain nights, locals say you can still hear a painful howl and that if you head to the top of Big Rock, you'll be faced with the ghost of Old Raridan, still ready to fight in his afterlife. And finally, number one now, we have the Bloody Bridge. Sometimes you can just tell from these titles where these stories are heading. This bridge lies just outside of Spencerville, crossing the Miami Erie Canal. According to legend, the bridge was the site of a grisly murder in 1854. In the years before that, a rivalry grew between two local men, Bill Jones and Jack Billings. Both had fallen for a woman called Minnie Warren. In the end, Minnie chose Jack, sending Bill into a fit of rage. One night in 1854, Minnie and Jack began to cross the bridge on their way home from a party. At the other end, though, stood Bill. He was holding an axe. They didn't have time to run. Bill took one swing and severed Jack's head clean off. Minnie screamed and jumped off the bridge and into her watery grave. Bill then disappeared until his skeleton was found years later in a well. Was it suicide or revenge from the couple's family? Either way, the years since then have seen reports of ghostly images of the murder couple on the bridge. Some even say that when the water gets dark enough, you can look over the bridge and see Minnie Warren's face staring right back at you in horror. At number 10, we have the Green Clawed Beast. Imagine you're out enjoying your afternoon, lounging on an inner tube, floating in the river, when all of a sudden you are attacked by a creature. Because that is exactly what happened to a woman named Naomi Johnson. On August 21st of 1955, Miss Johnson was out enjoying a swim with her friend in Ohio River near Evansville, Indiana. While swimming, Miss Johnson said that she was suddenly grabbed and pulled underwater by a large, hairy claw hand. She struggled underwater until she was able to kick herself free. She resurfaced only to shortly be pulled under again by this creature. Thankfully, Miss Johnson managed to escape once again. When she reached land, she had multiple bruises bruises and wounds on her leg, one of which was a green claw print shaped hand. Now, Miss Johnson never got a good look at the creature, but could sense how big and strong it was from the force it used on her. This encounter was reported to an Air Force colonel who took detailed notes and then told Miss Johnson and her friend to never mention it again. Very suspicious. What is this man hiding? Was it a creature of his own that escaped? No one knows. But what they do know is to never swim in that river again. Moving on to number nine, we have the Cry Baby Bridge. Now, there are tons of haunted bridges in Ohio. We previously talked about the Bloody Bridge and the Brubaker Bridge, but there are so many more, including the Cry Baby Bridge. 
The Crybaby Ridge is located in Fremont, Ohio, and is supposedly haunted by a ghost of a baby and a mother who passed away. According to legend, in 1883, a woman by the name of Lizzie Schatt threw her baby over the bridge after giving birth to it out of wedlock. She was ashamed of her sin and didn't want to keep her baby as a reminder. To this day, you can hear the child crying in the middle of the night and can even sometimes see Lizzie wandering the bridge looking for her child out of guilt. In our 8th spot we have Walhalla Road. Located in North Columbus, this road is supposedly one of the scariest roads in Ohio. Legend has it that around 1950, a doctor by the name of Mooney and his wife and kids used to live among the road. It is said that one night Mr. Mooney lost his mind and murdered his family along this road. Apparently if you walk this road in the dead of night then you will see the ghost of Dr. Mooney murdering his family. You will also be able to hear them screaming and hollering. Like the name of the road is literally Walhalla, like Hala, like ha get it? Just a weird coincidence. Also, if you walk this road at night, it is said that you can see an eerie blue light appearing from the attic of the Mooney's old mansion. Coming in at number 7, we have Loveland Castle. Although it may sound like a nice place to go for a honeymoon, don't be fooled. It's not. <laughs> well, maybe if you guys have a thing for ghosts. Not judging. Now, this castle was actually handmade by a man named Harry Andrews back in 1929. Harry was obsessed with medieval times and architecture and decided to build this towering castle in the middle of the Midwest. Andrew passed away in April of 1981 at the age of 91. Loveland Castle is now a museum spot for tourists to visit. It is said that people have seen a shadowy figure roam the halls that resembles Harry. Typically, this ghost makes an appearance when something in the castle is going to go wrong. This may be Harry's way of still looking after the castle after passing away. In fact, one time, sounds of slamming doors could be heard upstairs. Upon investigation, they noticed that the septic tank was about to overflow. They believe that the slamming doors was Harry's way to warn them about this. And lastly, there is also said to be another spirit roaming the castle. This spirit is referred to as the Viking Entity. Now, people believe that this entity is attached to one of Harry's antique swords in the castle. This Viking can be seen in a long black cloak carrying a sword at his chest. Moving on to number 6, we have Riders Inn. Now, if you ever need a place to stay in Ohio, don't worry, I got you covered with a list of haunted inns not to stay at. Now, on this list is a bed and breakfast known as Riders Inn. In this inn, you can enjoy their restaurant, comfy accommodations, and of course, three ghosts. The first ghost that people have claimed to see is of a man dressed in a Civil War uniform. Now, both the other two ghosts are Roxani and Susanna, the second and third wives of the inn's founder, Joseph Ryder. Apparently, Roxani is a friendly ghost, whereas Susanna causes trouble around the inn. Inn residents have stated that they have been let into the inn by a woman in a white nightgown when the doors should have been locked. This was either the ghost of Roxani or Susanna. Now, may I mention that this inn is literally located on a street named Painesville? Like, what are the odds? We are now at our halfway mark with number 5. The Witch's Ball. What's a scary legend without some witches? Myrtle Hill Cemetery in Medina County is known for getting quite the group of interested people. Among all the graves, there's one in particular that stands out, and that's because it's marked with a giant sphere. This story revolves around a woman that endured a lot of suffering throughout her life. As a result, she ended up murdering her family members. She would have gotten away with it too if it wasn't for those meddling kids and their dog. Just kidding. But I love Scooby-Doo. Classic. But seriously, she would have gotten away with it if it wasn't for the town members who realized that her family just started to disappear. They believe that she was a witch and she was practicing her magic in the woods. As a result, she was stoned to death and buried under the giant sphere. Now, apparently she was buried standing up to make it hard for her to escape, and the sphere was put on top as another precaution to make sure she never arose. However, it is said that her spirit has found a way to escape. In the winter time, snow will not fall on the sphere or the ground around it. On top of that, if you touch the spear, it will appear warm from the witch's energy, and in the summer, it will appear cold. 
People have also claimed that they have seen her figure in the woods, by the cemetery, or even seen an eye on the ball itself. Coming in at number 4, we have the Akron Civic Theater. Built in 1929 by Marcus Lowe, the Akron Civic Theater is a nice place to watch theatrical performances and even see ghosts. Although this theater is beautiful, it has a much darker past. Now, there is said to be three ghosts that haunt this theater. The first ghost is of a janitor named Fred. Fred apparently was the janitor for the theater and passed away one evening on his shift. Fred's ghost has been seen throughout the theater and in fact, one person reported seeing him standing just outside the main entrance. It is also said that Fred becomes angry for anyone that dirties up the bathroom and will chase or attack them. Uh. No thanks, I'd rather hold it in if that's the case. The second ghost is of a man who is said to be a frequent theater goer or even of an actor that used to work there. He is said to lurk on the balcony and is fashionably dressed. And the last ghost is of a woman who died after jumping into the canal which is below the theater. Her spirit is still said to roam the theater and is often heard crying. Let's move on to number 3 with the headless ghost. In October of 1889, a train conductor by the name of John Walsh was bringing the train along the Nickel Plate Railroad in Arcadia. While waiting for the signal that would allow him to continue traveling, he noticed that a section of the train cars had disconnected. While trying to reconnect them, the other missing section came barreling towards him, smashing his head between the two cars. In January of 1890, it is said that an engineer has seen John's ghost. Apparently at night you can see John's headless ghost roaming the tracks looking for his, well, lost head. It is also said that he carries a lantern which he swings back and forth and people have seen the eerie glow of his lantern at night. In our second spot we have Helltown. What a nice sounding town to visit in Ohio. Helltown is located in an abandoned town of Newville in Ohio. Now Helltown wasn't always the name given to this area. It was once known as Boston Mills, but it was bought out by the government who forced the residents to leave the town. Legend states that the government closed down Boston Mills after a chemical accident that occurred there. As a result of this accident, citizens began to mutate. Some people have claimed to see these disfigured, mutated residents still lurking in the area. It is also said that murdered children roam the woods of Helltown. Apparently, while headed to school, a school bus filled with students ran out of gas. They were stranded in the middle of nowhere when they were killed by a patient from a mental asylum. It is said that the ghost of these children still roam the woods and can be seen at night along with hearing their screams. And in our number one spot we have the West Branch Witch. Eh, another witch related legend. Surprise, surprise. In the West Branch State Park of Portage County there have been many claims of people encountering a woman dressed in all black. The first appearance was reported in 1960 by a man named B.A. Evans. He recently purchased a piece of land and later discovered a small cemetery on it. This cemetery contains seven gravestones surrounded by a 40 inch wall. The gravestones are apparently from a family named the Elliots. The headstone that gets the most attention is that of Clemenza. Clemenza was apparently killed by a group of townspeople after being accused of being a witch. As a result, she was pressed. Basically, a wooden board was placed on her and then on top was piled with stones until her body was crushed by the weight. To this day, her grave is marked by a pile of stones that rests on top of it. It is said that she haunts the graveyard and the surrounding area. In fact, on her tombstone is a curse that says, remember youth as you pass by. As you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so must you be. Prepare for death and follow me. If you read it out loud by her grave, she will apparently chase you away. Now, this legend continues saying that one night, a group of kids took stones from Clemenza's grave. Later on, they died on their way home in a car accident, but the one kid that didn't take the stone survived. So any geologists out there, I recommend not taking any rocks from this site. Coming in at number 10, we have Men in Black. I mean, where do you think the idea of the smash hit comedy starring Will Smith came from? You thought it was an original idea? Yo, I thought it was an original idea. I thought Will Smith is a genius. No way, man. <laughs> well, let's be honest, nothing is original anymore. As Picasso said, a good artist creates things. A great artist steals everything.
everything. I'm pretty sure that he actually stole that line too. Well, the urban legend of the men in black is pretty in line with the movie. I don't think it's as fantastical or as heroic, but the idea is that there are secret government agents all throughout the US who will come find you if you have any sort of contact with extraterrestrials. They monitor the planet and it's up to them to make sure that they don't learn about aliens. There have been many reports from people saying that they've seen some strange thing in the sky or that something landed in their backyard and then it takes off and then the next day a couple dudes in black suits come in who present themselves as FBI agents and they'll come to their house and ask them some very strange questions. And even in some cases they can be threatened or things could get quite ugly. Well threats from strange dudes in a black suit? Yeah, that would work well for me. I'm threatened by anything. I'll keep all my alien secrets to myself after something like that. Thank you very much. If I see something in my backyard, I'm reporting it to nobody. Coming in number eight, we have Skinwalkers. This is one of the oldest Native American legends and the legend has stretched into our folklore as we see skinwalkers represented in television and movies all the time. The true form of a skinwalker is unknown. I mean, Che right here could be a skinwalker right now. We don't know his true form. Well, some people say that they start off as humans and then they get the ability to transform and others say they are truly beasts who can turn into humans and other creatures to try to fool us. But at the end of the day, does it really matter what the true form of a shapeshifter is? They can become whatever they want. You think after being a certain form for a while, you forget what it's like to be your true self. It would be like method acting when you get two into a role and you can't remember who you really are. Well, maybe Daniel Day-Lewis is a skinwalker and he's just not as evil as the rest. Skinwalkers have been known to use their powers of transformation to lure people into traps and kill them. Sometimes it's said that they can use parts of dead humans as food and other stories tell of them needing human parts for rituals to continue their shape-shifting ways. And at number seven, the abominable snowman. Abominable snowman sighting in Spain caught on camera. That's right, folks. The proof the world has been waiting for has finally been uploaded. A Sasquatch, or Yeti, or Abominable Snowman, or just plain old Bigfoot, whatever you want to call him, has been spotted, supposedly. There are so many clips just like the one you just saw on YouTube. You can check it out for yourselves. Well, we think that this is the best footage we've ever seen of this thing. Coming in at number six, we have the Bunny Man. There are several different stories of the Bunny Man, and almost all of them are gruesome. The most common is that he's a man man who will walk through dark alleys or in the forest or anywhere with poor visibility and he will follow people. He sports a bunny mask and has a massive axe. In the shadows, he creeps slowly, watches his prey, and waiting for the moment when they aren't protected. In those few moments when their guard is lowered, he will spring out and slam his axe into their face, taking their body back into the darkness. There have been some iterations of the bunny man that say he doesn't wear a mask, but his face has been horribly mutilated to make it look as if it was of bunnies. Skin has been grafted onto his head to resemble ears, surgery done on his nose and lips to reveal buck teeth and a rabbit-like nose, and disgusting scarring all over his once human image. This disfiguration that happened to him is what caused him to go mad. Moving right along just like that, number five, the Mothman. Hey, is it possible the famous Mothman of West Virginia could be a mysterious giant eagle? Or is it still just a big, mysterious unknown? The Mothman of West Virginia has been a longtime urban legend dating back to the 60s. And there has been several movies and documentaries based on this creature, along with a ton of real people recounting their experiences and sharing their pictures and videos. It's such a crazy urban legend that, you know what, it might be true after all. The sightings of Mothman continued for months throughout the Point Pleasant area. The Mothman was once seen again on the Silver Bridge and many people believe that the creature was trying to warn people. And at number four, we have Baby Train. Well, let's step away from the horrifying urban legends for a second to think about something that could be true and has been a tale told all over America. Even though the Baby Train sounds like something where people would sell babies to the highest bidder, this urban legend is much more wholesome. Now, this urban legend is attached to a more forgotten time, which makes it both hard to prove and disprove. But it's the idea of small towns that 
that were positioned close to train stations. These towns were so close that when the trains came in and blew its steam whistle, everyone could hear. Now for some of these places, they would have an early morning train come through town. If it would blow its whistle around 5 a.m., this would wake up the whole town. For most of these fine folks, 5 a.m. was too early to get up, but too late to go back to sleep. So all of these people waking up next to their partner decided to just make a little hanky-panky. This was a time before we had phones and Netflix. There was nothing else to do. So this idea of this urban legend is that the towns that had the baby train would see a baby boom from all of the early morning, you know, whoopies. These people are reproducing faster than Joey Chestnut clears a plate of food. Moving into number three, we have the New Jersey Devil. Have you guys heard of this? Claiming that this child would be the devil. When the night came that Jane went into labour, there was a terrible storm that shook the entire house as her friends and family gathered to help her through their pregnancy. The child was born normal, but it began to change into a deformed monstrosity. Its feet turned into hooves, its head resembled a goat. Leathery wings sprouted from its back, and a forked tail whipped violently around the room. The child screamed and thrashed its tail at anyone trying to hold it down. This is a crazy tale that might actually just be true, considering the NHL team is named the New Jersey Devils. Could this be because of this urban legend? Rumor has it a woman had her 13th baby and said, let the child be the devil. Although they tried to exercise it, shoot it, and kill it, it was deemed indestructible. And there have been 13 sightings of this creature throughout history, so it's gotta be true. 13 people have seen it. Coming in number two, we have Charman. We had a couple sweet points in a row, and that's the only nice ones you're gonna get. For a second, I thought you were gonna say Charmander, because I was like, that's real. Pokemon are real. They are. But in this situation, we're talking about Charman, which isn't Charmander. Well, Charman is one of the most horrifying urban legends to come out of America. It combines some classic tales with some very specific details that make it seem like the whole thing could be true. The story starts back in 1948. There was a house fire, a father and his son tried to escape unharmed, but the flames are too strong and the two of them are burned all over their body. While waiting for help to arrive, the son is looking at his disfigured self and loses his mind. He then kills his own father. Is this real life right now? When help eventually does arrive, the son lays on the ground and the police think that the boy, well, he's dead from how badly he's burnt. They leave for a moment and uses this as an opportunity to escape. From this point, he has to live in the woods, hunting down people and killing them, taking what he can so he can continue to survive in the wilderness and feed his insane bloodlust without anyone finding him. Starting off with number 10, the bloody headstone. Riverside Cemetery in Appleton, Wisconsin has been a popular attraction site for those who seek a paranormal thrill, or for those who just wish to get haunted. Among the numerous graves in the cemetery, there is one in particular that gets ongoing attention, Kate Blood. Given the nickname Kitty Blood, she was a supposed child killer, witch, and adulteress. Now her ghost is said to roam the cemetery at night and haunt her gravesite. When people visit her secluded grave, they claim to have been pushed or touched by her ghost, and some have even seen her apparition. They also claim that the area around her grave is unusually warm, and that's from her presence lurking around. What is most unsettling is that on the night of a full moon, apparently blood can be seen seeping through her headstone. Honestly, I just feel sorry for the groundskeeper that has to continuously clean up that mess. That's terrible. All right, making our way to number nine, the jogging woman on Vine Street. So. I don't know what's scarier, thinking about going for a run or encountering a ghost that likes to run. Vine Street in Eau Claire is a nice, quiet, peaceful, haunted neighborhood. It is said that the ghost of a woman who was hit and killed by a drunk driver while jogging haunts this street. Her shadowy figure can be seen darting in front of cars, only to disappear right after. You know what? Running already haunts me as it is, so I can't imagine witnessing this as well. Number seven, the hitchhiker of Highway 12. First off, let me say that if you're one of those people that stop and pick up hitchhikers, what are you doing? You don't know their agenda. They could be a killer, or in this case, a ghost. Apparently along the road of Highway 12, people have claimed to see a scruffy man with a dark beard, long greasy black hair who is dressed in blue jeans and an army jacket. Those who see this man drive past him thinking nothing of it, only shocked when miles down the road they encounter the same guy. Those who are, I mean, brave enough to stop and 
offer this man a ride, find that he disappears without a trace when they approach him. No one knows why this ghostly man is here or why he is haunting the roadside. Next at number 6 we have the Bloody Bride Bridge. I think a lot of people's worst fear on their wedding day is having either their bride or groom get cold feet and not show up. Well, the Bloody Bride Bridge refers to the legend of a bride who got killed on the bridge while on her way to the wedding. It is now said that you can see this bride in her white dress lurking on the bridge at night. In fact, a police officer has witnessed this firsthand when he spotted her laying down on the bridge. He went to go call for an ambulance, but when he went back to her, she had mysteriously disappeared. It is also said that if you park your car near the bridge around midnight, the bride will appear in the back seat of your car. So word from the wise, if you and your lover decide to get it on in your car, don't park near this bridge unless you want her in the back seat. We are now at our halfway point with number 5. Hogs Back Road, Goat Man. Here is another road I suggest you add to your list of places not to visit. And there's a good reason for it. Hogsback Road is said to be home of a strange monster that is half man and half goat. His upper body is that of a man with horns and sharp fingernails, while the lower half of his body is of a goat with reddish fur. It is said that this creature hunts for lost travelers to torment or kill. Apparently this creature was once a man who was killed along this road and is now a restless spirit. In fact, a woman named Mindy Rosette believes that her and her daughter had encountered Goatman. They were driving by this area when the creature ran in front of her car. This is how she described the creature. His legs seemed to be bent back, the knees like a dog's. His muscles were really defined, thighs especially. I couldn't make out the hands because of the way it was running. I couldn't see the feet as I couldn't see past the car hood. Instantly, I knew this was something incredible. In our number 4 spot, we have Boy Scouts Lane. Now, as the name suggests, Boy Scouts Lane may sound like the spot to go where Boy Scouts go to learn to tie knots, roast marshmallows, and do other things that Boy Scout related activities, I don't know. However, as you may have guessed, this is not the case. Boy Scouts Lane is an unpaved, secluded small trail that is said to be the place where a troop of Boy Scouts were murdered by their scout master. Other versions of the story state that it was the bus driver that murdered them all, or even that they just died in a bus crash. No matter what version of the story you may hear, it all centers around the theme of a group of Boy Scouts tragic death. It is said that if you roam this path, you may feel as if you are being watched. Witnesses have said that they have seen the apparition of the scout master, and that child sized handprints have appeared on their car. Honestly, if I'm gonna go encounter these ghosts, they uh, can at least offer me some Boy Scout cookies, especially those Thin Mints. Those are my secret addiction, okay? Bringing it down to number three, we have the Ridgeway Ghost. Here we go with another haunted road in Wisconsin. Are you shocked? I'm not. Along Route 151, there seems to be two shape-shifting spirits that haunt the area. This legend dates back to the 1840s and is said that a bar fight between two teen brothers and other men resulted in their tragic death. One of the brothers were torched and burned alive, while the other boy froze to death trying to escape these men. It is said that these ghosts have been seen as a headless horseman, a ball of fire, a man with a whip, or even as a big beast. Other people believe that these ghosts can shape-shift into animals such as pigs and and dogs. This ghost could definitely play tricks on people. Like, imagine you're gonna go pet a cute dog and all of a sudden it turns into the headless horseman. Yeah. No thanks. Coming in second, we have the Rylander Hodag. Now, if you visit the town of Rylander, you are bound to encounter the Hodag creature, but not in the way you think. This town has numerous statues and paintings of the Hodag all throughout the town. The Hodag is a 265 pound creature with a frog's head, a dinosaur looking body, short legs, and a long tail. The creature also has two large sharp fangs hanging out of its mouth and reddish glowing eyes. It is said that this creature is aware of its ugliness and spends a lot of time crying over it. I'm feeling slightly targeted here. Legend has it that one of these creatures were caught in the 1890s, however, there are still more out there. It is also said that there are only three ways to kill it. Chloroform, dynamite, and lemons. So if you ever plan to visit Rhinelander, make sure you bring the essentials. Toothbrush, toothpaste, chloroform, dynamite, and lemons. I'm sure airport security will understand. And lastly, in our top spot, we have the Maribel Hotel. The Maribel Hotel was once a nice spa for travelers to enjoy, but is now known as Hotel Hell. Legend has it that one night, a hotel guest ended up murdering all of the other guests in their 
sleep. From then on, the hotel has become haunted. The freakiest part about this hotel is that it has burned down three different times, but on the exact same day. When that happened, the guests perished in their sleep. It is said that the remains of some of these bodies can be found on the third floor. However, it is now inaccessible from structure failure in the stairs. Still to this day, it is said that you can hear screaming from the basement. Well, now I know where to not stay if I make a trip to Wisconsin. At number 10, we have the Maiden Cliff. If you have a wardrobe malfunction, you would expect it to embarrass you or maybe show off your butt crack a little bit. You don't expect to die and become a restless ghost for the rest of time. Well, the legend of the Maiden Cliff is that it's haunted by a ghost of a woman who met her end because her hat blew off her head. She was standing near the edge of the cliff for a photo and then a huge gust of wind slapped her hat off her head and sent it flying away. But this hat cost good money, so she wasn't going to let Mother Nature try and steal it away from her. She tried to catch her hat, but she wasn't as quick and agile as she thought. She ended up losing her footing and falling all the way down to her death. Now it's said that her ghost walks around the cliff and has been seen in photos that people have taken of the cliff. Ghosts always have unfinished business and I definitely know that this ghost just wants its hat back. At number 9 we have Wessie. There was a monster spotted in a forest in Maine by several people who got the nickname Wessie. Someone reported to a policeman that there was a large snake like monster eating what might have been a beaver. Everyone thought it was a joke at first but when a couple more people came with the same story the police decided to go investigate. Then it's reported that one police police officer did come across what seemed to be a 12 foot long anaconda, but in Maine. These are massive snakes that are normally found in the Amazon. How did this creature make its way out there and could it potentially attack a person? A crew of snake specialists went out in search of the snake to capture it and take it into a sanctuary, but the snake was never found. Maybe it was lost in the forest, maybe the unorthodox environment led to the snake's death, or maybe there was something supernatural happening and the long snake like creature wasn't a snake at all, but something a little bit more spooky. At number 8 we have the circus ship. Did you know that this used to be a thing? They would have a circus on a boat, on the water, everything powered by by steam. That sounds like the drunken dream of a guy from 1901. Well, it was a real thing. There was a circus ship that set sail in 1836 named the Royal Tar that was packed with animals. There was horses, camels, birds, and even an elephant on board. They were planning to have some crazy times on this boat, and they were putting on some pretty good shows for all the people on board. When the boat got off the coast of Maine, the weather took a turn for the worst, and things started getting pretty brutal on board. The steam engine caught fire, and the fire spread to the rest of the boat. They tried to save all the animals and every person on board, but they weren't able to. 32 people died on a circus boat that day, which sounds like something out of a Danny McBride script. Some people say that they can see the ghostly silhouette of the boat floating in the water on certain nights. At number 7 we have the ghost of an opera singer. I don't think you could create a more annoying ghost. The ghost of an opera singer seems like it would keep you up all night with a bunch of music you don't even know the words to. Like if you're gonna haunt me, could you at least sing some top 40 so I could sing along or something? The University of Maine famously is haunted by the ghost of an opera singer that has an auditorium named after her. As we have already covered, ghosts haunt something when they have unfinished business. But what more do you want in life? You have a massive building named after you. What, you need to go for the Grammy now too? You had your chance when you were alive, stop being so greedy, go to bed, let me sleep. But it's the ghost of Lillian Nordica. It said when you were walking through the auditorium, you can hear her singing some opera hits. At number 6 we have the main state prison. Show me someone who says they found a prison that isn't haunted and I will show you a liar. I think that prisons come pre-haunted. It goes into the concrete or something. Like the, the way they make the building, they just feed it with ghosts. But the main state prison fits the common theme of prisons that have ghosts walking through the halls like it's some sort of ghoul convention. There have been reports of people feeling cold spots, disembodied voices, footsteps, and some inmates have even seen a dark figure walking around the halls and then disappearing into walls. Ooh. This is the kicker. Remember how I said every prison is destined to be haunted? You can't have a prison function without some sort of spectral activity. Well, apparently some of the equipment that was brought over to the main state prison before it opened was from another prison that was haunted and the ghosts followed the equipment to the new location. It was just meant to be. At number four, we have the piano ghost. Here's something I've learned about ghosts. They love to play the piano. It's so easy for them. They just have to push down and the music comes out. They suck at wind instruments. They lack the lung power. You'll never see a ghost killing it on the saxophone. That doesn't exist. But there's a ghost that has found its home in the Booth Bay Opera House. There isn't a lot of information as to where this ghost might have come from. Some people think it could have been someone who had a heart attack while watching one of the performances in the Opera House. But that's not the part that matters. What matters is if you head upstairs to the second floor, you might see a piano play itself. Well, 
being played by a ghostly figure. I heard he takes requests though. At number two, we have the main mist. Now, no one knows which came first, the urban legend about the main mist or the story from Stephen King, but they kind of fit around the same idea. The mist in Maine has become legendary because it is so constant. It has also been a major cause for sailors crashing into shores and rocks. Now, because the mist is so dense and boats end up getting destroyed while they're inside of it, it has started a legend that there is something that hides in the mist and takes people off their ships for itself. This isn't the only time we have connected monsters to the mist. It's said that Cthulhu travels in a great mist to remain unseen. And for the number one spot, we have the Pomola. This creature from Native American legend is said to be the protector of the tallest mountain in Maine and possesses great power. It has been described as a cross between a human and an eagle with a great wingspan and large horns like the kind a moose has. This thing is definitely a hodgepodge of animals and is nearly impossible to get a look at. If you try to climb the mountain to try and get a look at it, it will get a sense of you before you get up there and will know you're coming. It will most likely fly away to a place where you can't see it. The legend goes even deeper and says if you are very persistent and try to find it, it will control the weather and create a storm to knock you off the mountain. Number 9. Munchkin Land Once again in Cincinnati, there is a legend of a place called Munchkin Land, aka Tiny Town, located near Rumpke Landfill. There was an area featuring a collection of small houses and buildings where small people were said to live, hurling rocks at passing cars in order to ward them off. There are stories about the unfortunate folks who stopped their car in the area only to be met with angry little folk rushing out of their tiny homes, rocks in hand. As to where these small people are said to come from, some say they were all retired circus performers, others say they're simply mythical creatures. Now you can check the area out for your Yourself, but unfortunately most of these structures have been torn down now so if there really was a town full of angry munchkins living there I guess they scattered and built a new township maybe deeper in the woods possibly and at number eight we have the ghost of Amy if you decide to check out munchkin land you might as well make your way to this area too because they're in very close proximity just outside of Cincinnati lies Lick Road a road that is said to be home uh, of to a ghost. Amy was said to have died at the hands of her boyfriend, either at the cul-de-sac, at the end of the road, or by the bridge nearby. There are said to be a number of ways to experience the ghost of Amy. One legend goes that if you flick your headlights onto the sign as you're turning onto Lick Road, you can see Amy briefly flash onto it. Another goes that if you park your car and face the woods, then flash your headlights three times, your windows will start to fog up and the word help will appear in the windshield. And of course, there's just the ghostly phenomena that's said to go on there. Some have reported seeing the ghostly figure of a young woman dressed in a white gown standing at the edge of the forest. And if you decide to get out of your car and walk across the nearby bridge, you may just hear footsteps following you into the woods. Next up we have the Wax Man. Once again, another Cincinnati urban legend. Lots going on there. Uh, a tunnel to hell, munchkins who throw rocks. There's a hook-handed man I may discuss later in the list. And a mysterious man with a waxy face. So the legend goes that this man leaves his home at the same time every night at 11.30 and drives his gold car to the junkyard. He's often described as an elderly man with a face that appears to be made out of wax. Now, I don't know if that means his face is just kind of shiny or if it looks like his face is melting. If you've ever seen him, please let me know in the comments. People have reported trying to follow him, but he's very good at evading people, timing his trip perfectly so that he never hits a red light. And as to what he does in this junkyard, nobody is completely certain. Some say that he's a ghost who died in the junkyard, forever doomed to repeat the final moments leading up to his death. Number six, the gazebo in Eden Park. The Springhouse gazebo is said to be one of the most haunted places in Ohio. The story goes that in 1925, a Cincinnati attorney by the name of George Remus was sent to prison for bootlegging. And during his two year sentence, his wife, Imogen Remus, started an affair. She and her lover took everything from him, and when he came out of prison, she told him she was filing for a divorce. On her way to the courthouse, though, Remus drove her off the road by the nearby gazebo before getting out of his car and fatally shitting her. Imogen is said to haunt the gazebo until this day, described as a ghostly figure wearing a black silk dress. 
Unlike with most ghosts though, she's apparently often seen in the early hours of the morning before the sun has fully risen. Next on the list is Buffalo Ridge. Located in Cleves, Ohio, this place is home to a number of ghostly tales. There's supposedly an abandoned crematorium where satanic rituals took place. There's said to be a demon dog stalking the forest, a headless ghost who roams the land in search of her head. There's also a bottomless lake where unfortunate victims were dumped, their spirits trapped within the murky water. There's a, a tale of a group of teenagers in the 50s who crashed on Buffalo Ridge Road and another said to be a ghostly car that attempts to run people off the road too. The most famous legend surrounding Buffalo Ridge tells of a young man who was hit by a speeding drunk driver. The boy left a blood stain on the road, a stain that never seems to go away. And if you do find the stain, decide to stop and inspect it, stay alert because the van of the hit and run driver from all those years ago might appear and try to run you over too. So that's two ghost cars, a headless ghost, a demon dog, a creepy lake, a haunted crematorium, all in just one specific place. Keep saying this, but I gotta go to Ohio. Next up we have the legend of the melon heads. According to this story, a group of deformed and feral individuals known as the melon heads reside in forests around Kirtland. These figures are said to have large heads resembling melons and uh, just kind of creep people out. According to the legend, they were once children who suffered from physical and mental abnormalities due to cruel experimentation by a sinister mad scientist. Escaping captivity though, they are believed to have retreated into the woods, surviving by hunting and remaining hidden from outside society. Some versions claim they attack intruders who venture into their territory, while others portray them as more reclusive, mysterious, doing their own thing, peering only in glimpses before quickly retreating into the forest. At number three, we have Dead Man's Curve in Cleveland. Now, this is a section of road that has claimed the lives of a number of drivers. One story goes that in 1969, a car full of teenagers smashed into a speeding 1969 Roadrunner. There was only one survivor. At the intersection of state routes 125 and 222, where this accident took place, some have reported seeing a faceless hitchhiker standing by the side of the road between 1.20 and 1.40 a.m. Sometimes he's even seen standing right in the middle of the road, leading drivers to nearly crash trying to avoid him. And those who don't move out of the way in time report phasing right through him, at which point he'll start chasing the car down the road before eventually vanishing into thin air. Some also claim to have seen either an Impala, the type of car that teenagers have been driving, or a Roadrunner driving along the road with no one in the front seat. It's said to be one of the most haunted places in Claremont County, but if you decide to pay it a visit, just keep your eyes on the road. Number two, the Hook Man. In the village of New Richmond, there is said to be a terrifying specter, that of a ghostly figure with a hook for a hand. The man with a hand for a hook is pretty much the staple of urban legends. There are many different versions of hook-handed ghost stories, but Ohio's goes a little something like this. On Pond Run Road lived a doctor and his wife. They had a son who was mentally disturbed, and being the despicable pricks that they were, their son was kept chained up in the basement most of the time. One night, there was a terrible storm and lightning struck their home, setting it ablaze. When authorities arrived on the scene, they found the parents burnt to death, but there were no remains of the boy, other than his severed hand chained up to the wall in the basement. As the years went on, the boy grew up and stalking the wooded area, stealing from homes nearby. Stories of couples being found stabbed to death in the area led some to believe they died at the hands of the hook man. And these stories continued, developing into the types of hook hand urban legends we often think of. A couple making out in their car, they hear a strange noise. The guy makes the smart decision to get out of the car and check things out rather than just drive away and pays for it by taking a hook to the cranium. 
And finally, we have the Spring Grove Cemetery in Cincinnati. Once again, Cincinnati. This is the second largest cemetery in the USA, and cemeteries are pretty much always haunted. Plus, I mean, this is Ohio, so no surprises here that there's some spooky stuff going on. There are many tragic ghostly tales associated with this cemetery, but probably the most famous is that of an optometrist by the name of C.C. Brewer. Before he died, he asked that his eyes be removed and placed in the bronze bust on his gravestone. Now, the eyes aren't actually real, obviously. They're just made of glass, but they do stand out from the rest of the bust. Many visitors of the grave claim to watch the eyes follow them as they move. Another story goes that a caretaker was working alone one night when he felt something firmly tug at his pants leg. He immediately panicked and ran off, and he returned to the exact area later on, expecting to see something that he most likely got stuck on, but the area was clear, nothing but graves below his feet. Here. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have the Loveland Frog. As someone who is not from Ohio, this is probably the most famous of all the Ohio urban legends I came across. The Loveland Frog is an urban legend that originated in Loveland, Ohio in the 1950s, and according to the legend, a group of local men spotted a humanoid, frog-like creature near the Little Miami River. They claimed that the creature was about four feet tall, had leathery skin, and webbed hands and feet. Feet. Over the years, there have been several reported sightings of the Loveland Frog, including one in 1972 by a police officer named Ray Shockey. Shockey claimed that he saw a strange creature. It's so funny that his name is Shockey and that he saw like a strange cre like how sh what is more Shockey? You know what I mean? Uh, Shockey claimed that he saw a strange creature on the side of the road while on patrol. When he got closer, he saw that it was a creature with leathery skin and frog-like features. Shockey drew his gun and fired at the creature, but it quickly ran away and disappeared. The legend of the Loveland Frog has become a very popular topic among paranormal enthusiasts and cryptozoologists. Some believe that the creature could be an undiscovered species of amphibian or reptile, while others think it could be a hoax or a misidentification of a known animal. Regardless of its origins, the legend of the Loveland Frog has become a part of Ohio folklore, and the creature has become an iconic figure in the world of cryptozoology. In our number nine spot today, we have Ohio State Reformatory. Also known as Mansfield Reformatory, this spooky place is a former prison located in Mansfield, Ohio. It opened in 1896 and it closed in 1990. The prison is known for its very violent history and inhumane conditions, with reports of harm, bad conditions, and overcrowding. The prison is also rumored to be haunted, with many visitors reporting strange occurrences, such as cold spots, unexplained noises, and ghostly apparitions. One of the most famous ghosts said to haunt the prison is that of Helen Glatke, the wife of a former superintendent who died in a car accident outside of the prison. Her spirit is said to still wander the prison, often appearing in the chapel or the administration area. Another famous ghost is that of the ghost in the tower, believed to be the spirit of a former inmate who died in a tragic accident while working in the prison's bell tower. Visitors have reported hearing his screams and seeing his ghostly figure in the tower. The prison has been featured in several films and TV shows, including The Shawshank Redemption and Ghost Adventures, which of course only worked to further popularize its reputation as a haunted location. In our number eight spot today, we have the Lake Hope Furnace. The Lake Hope Furnace in Ohio has a dark and haunting history that has given rise to many tales of paranormal activity. The furnace was built in the mid 19th century to process iron ore mined in the area. Many workers lost their lives due to the dangerous work working conditions and the furnace was shut down in the early 1900s. Over the years, visitors to the area have reported strange occurrences including unexplained noises, sudden drops in temperature, and ghostly apparitions. Many believe that the spirits of the workers who died at the furnace still haunt the area. One of the most famous stories associated with the Lake Hope Furnace is that of a ghostly woman in a white dress who is said to wander the grounds. Legend has it that the woman was the wife of a worker who was killed in an accident at the furnace. She is said to be searching for her husband's lost wedding ring, which she believes is still somewhere on the property. Another ghostly tale is that of a former worker who is said to have lost his life here, but was never able to leave. Visitors have reported seeing his spirit coming by the furnace in order to light it. While he carries a lantern in one hand, if anybody gets too close to him, it's said he vanishes into the darkness. In our number seven spot today, we have the Werewolf of Defiance. The legend of the Werewolf of Defiance in Ohio dates back to the early 1900s. 
1800s. According to the story, a man who lived in the woods near Defiance was rumored to have transformed into a werewolf on nights of the full moon. Local residents claimed to have heard howls and seen a large wolf-like creature lurking in the shadows. Some even reported close encounters with the creature, which was said to be larger and more ferocious than any normal wolf. Despite numerous attempts to hunt the creature, the werewolf was never caught. The legend of the werewolf of Defiance continues to be a popular topic of discussion in the area, and many believe that the creature still roams the woods to this day. Whether the werewolf of Defiance was a real creature or simply a product of local folklore remains a mystery. In our number six spot today, we have Satan's Hollow. Satan's Hollow is a drainage tunnel located in Blue Ash, Ohio, and it has been long rumored to be the site of supernatural activity. According to legend, the tunnel was once used by a group of Satanists who performed dark rituals and sacrifices within its walls. People who have ventured into the tunnel have reported seeing strange symbols and hearing ghostly whispers. Some have even claimed to have witnessed apparitions of demons and other supernatural beings. The legend of Satan's Hollow has attracted many curious visitors over the years, and some have reported strange experiences, such as unexplained temperature drops and sudden feelings of unease. Despite warnings from authorities and the dangers of the tunnel itself, and the fact that the tunnel is technically private property, many continue to seek out the site in search of thrills and scares, looking for the creature behind the most haunting tale of all, the Shadow Man. In our number five spot today, we have The Ridges. Athens Lunatic Asylum, also known as The Ridges, is a former mental institution located near Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. It has a long history of ghostly tales and supernatural occurrences. According to legend, the asylum was a site of brutal treatments and patient mistreatment, leading to the creation of restless spirits haunting the halls. There have been reports of shadowy figures, disembodied voices, and inexplicable noises, leading many to believe that the spirits of former patients still linger within the abandoned building. One of the most famous stories is that of Margaret Schilling, a patient who disappeared in 1978 and was found later dead in a hidden attic room. Her decomposing body left a stain on the floor that is said to be impossible to remove. The asylum has become a popular destination for paranormal investigators and thrill seekers, with many claiming to have had chilling experiences while exploring the abandoned institution. Despite its dark history and eerie reputation, the Athens Lunatic Asylum remains an important reminder of the past and the need for compassionate and ethical treatment of those suffering from mental illness. In our number four spot today, we have Eugene. This is less of a creepy pasta and more of an enduring mystery, and it all starts with a John Doe story. In 1929, the body of an older male appeared on the side of the road in Ohio. No one was ever able to identify who the man was, no one knew where he came from, or really had anything to go on. The only possible clue he had on him was an address, but it just led to a vacant lot. The closest neighbor to the address was named Eugene, so they decided to call this unidentified man Eugene as well. This is where a bit of a twist comes in. Instead of burying him, they decided to keep Eugene on display as a roadside attraction. Truly wish I was making that up, because first of all, Eugene deserves better than that, but also, who wants to see a dead body as a tourist attraction? For 35 years, Eugene was put on display until he was finally laid to rest. This is what has led his tombstone to read, Eugene, found dead in 1929, buried in 1964. To this day, we still don't quite know who Eugene was, where he came from, or what his story truly was. In our number three spot today, we have Beaver Creek. Beaver Creek State Park in Ohio is a popular destination for outdoor enthusiasts, but it is also the home to a very spooky urban legend. The park is said to be haunted by the ghost of a woman who drowned in the creek many years ago. According to the legend, the woman's body was never found, and her ghost now wanders the park searching for her lost family. There are also reports of strange noises and ghostly apparitions in and around the park's historic buildings, such as the Gaston's Mill and the Log Cabins. Some visitors have reported feeling a sense of unease or being watched while exploring the park, particularly at night. Another one of the most well-known ghost stories associated with Beaver Creek State Park is the legend of the headless motorcyclist. According to the legend, a man lost his head in a motorcycle accident on the road that runs through the park. His ghost now rides his motorcycle through the park looking for his missing head. Some visitors claim to have seen the ghostly figure on his motorcycle, while others have reported hearing the sound of a motorcycle engine revving in the distance. In our number two spot today, we have the Coin Mansfield Incident. What is a good old list of legends and spooky stories without a very real UFO incident, and perhaps one of the best 
known UFO sightings to take place in the state of Ohio. The Coin Mansfield helicopter incident occurred on October 18, 1973, when four members of the Ohio Army National Guard were flying in a helicopter over Mansfield, Ohio. Suddenly, they encountered a large metallic disc shaped object that was hovering in the sky. The object began to move towards the helicopter, causing the crew to take evasive maneuvers. Despite their efforts, the object continued to follow them, eventually passing overhead and disappearing into the distance. The crew reported the incident to their superiors, and an investigation was launched by the military and the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA. The incident received significant media attention, and it remains one of the most compelling UFO sightings on record. What makes this incident particularly intriguing is the credibility of the witnesses. The crew were all experienced pilots with military training, and their account of the incident was corroborated by radar data and other witnesses on the ground. Despite extensive investigations, no satisfactory explanation has ever been offered for what they saw that day. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have Gore Orphanage. Gore Orphanage is an abandoned building located in Vermilion, Ohio, that has long been the subject of haunting tales and urban legends. According to legend, in the early 1900s, a fire broke out in the building, killing everyone inside. The ghosts of those lost to the fire are said to haunt the surrounding woods and the building, and visitors have reported hearing the sounds of children's laughter and cries. Some versions of the legend claim that the orphanage was actually a satanic cult site site where humans were sacrificed in bizarre rituals. Others claimed that the place was actually just a place where real, non-magic or demonic related horrors took place. Despite the lack of evidence to support these claims, the legend of Gore Orphanage persists and has inspired numerous ghost hunters and paranormal investigators to explore the abandoned building. However, it is important to note that the building is private property and trespassing is illegal. Okay, So don't say I didn't warn ya. Moving on to number 9 now, we have Athens in Insane Asylum. Now, this building opened its doors in 1874, becoming one of Ohio's largest asylums for the mentally ill. In the beginning, things went well. It offered some of the best care to its patients. As the years went on, the owners realized that they could put some of the patients to work there, specifically on the nearby farm. The greedier they got, the more patients they took on. By the 1950s, it had become a dumping ground for anyone that a family couldn't afford or simply didn't want to look after. At 2,000 patients, it was now three times over its capacity, yet the number of staff remained unchanged. Patients were forcibly restrained for days at a time, left in crowded rooms meant for one person, and regularly beaten by staff. In 1993, the hospital finally closed its doors. The remaining buildings were left to Ohio University. In the years after, students would tell tales of strange figures standing in the empty wings in the former hospital. For me though, the creepy part is the report of a stain on the top floor of the building. They say it's of Margaret Skeeling, a patient who went missing in 1979. She was found 42 days later in an abandoned ward. Tests show that she died of heart failure, yet she was found naked next to her clothes folded neatly on the floor. To the horror of those who found her, the body had decomposed so badly that a stain had seeped into the actual concrete. It couldn't be scrubbed away, and they say to this day, the stain can still be seen. Moving on to number six now, we have Franklin Castle. This Victorian era building is said to be the most haunted house in Ohio, bar none. It's a bold claim, but the story seems to back it up. It was built in the 1880s by a grocer turned banker called Hans Tiedemann. Despite being rich, his life was struck by a number of tragedies. In that house, his 15 year old daughter died, so too did his mother and three other children who died in infancy. His wife became so overcome with grief that she became despondent. He attempted to distract her by turning the house into a sort of castle. He built elaborate tunnels, prominent gargoyles, and a sprawling network of rooms. He stopped though when his wife also passed away. He sold the property. It changed hands a number of times over the decades, and then in the 1960s, reports of hauntings in the house began to spread. There were strange electrical surges, the sound of babies crying, and a mysterious woman in black who roamed the hallways at night. In 1975, human bones were said to be found in a closet in the house. Now, Since then, there have been reports of an axe 
axe murderer there, a mass shooting of Nazis in the basement, and even the hanging of one of the original daughters of the family. People may dispute some of the stories, but some people who visit agree that a lasting presence can definitely be felt at Old Franklin Castle. Next up at number 4 now we have the Grass Man. You can think of this one as Ohio's version of Bigfoot. It's said to have all the same characteristics, a tall bipedal hominid that skulks around Ohio's deep woods. The Grass Man gets its name from apparently building small hut like structures or nests made out of tall grass. The first sighting occurred in 1978 when some local kids ran into their grandparents home screaming about a hairy monster they had just seen in the gravel pit outside. When the grandparents went outside to investigate, they saw it too. They said it was covered in dark matted hair, sitting in the pit and fiddling with some trash. They later estimated it to be about 300 pounds. The family fled, but it wasn't the last time that they or many other locals saw them. When people started investigating, they found records from the 1700s of Native Americans in the area who spoke of a race of bipedal ape men. They refer to them as the wild ones of the woods. I would often leave food out for them in an effort to keep the peace. Next up at number 3 now we have the Cincinnati Music Hall. This is a classical music performance hall in Cincinnati, completed in 1878. Before construction was even finished, it was said the location was a place where the dead render the lives of the living a burden to them. How intense does that sound? When a nearby canal was being made, authorities found over 100 human skeletons that had to be removed. They buried them in the ground on which this building now stands on. More remains were placed there in 1838 when a steamboat exploded and flung bodies all over the city. They were also buried in the ground below the music hall. If that wasn't enough to creep you out, it also stands atop of an old orphan asylum and an old civil war hospital. All of this has resulted in locals claiming it's the most haunted place in town. One night watchman felt the presence of ghosts there. He said, They never touch me, but I always know when they are around by an icy chill, a thrill of electricity. They never annoy me now by mere knocking, for I have gotten so used to it. So used to it that sometimes when people have really knocked at the door, I didn't open because I thought it was only the dead that kept knocking, knocking, knocking. Well, I'm glad he can be so calm with dead people knocking at the door at night. Most of us would just nope right out of there. I know I definitely would. And finally now, at the number one spot, we have the Wickerham Inn. In the 1790s, a man called Peter Wickerham moved to Adams County, Ohio and opened an inn. It was very popular and saw many coach drivers and locals stopping there to drink, eat and converse. One night though, a driver was bragging to the whole inn about how much money he was carrying. Some men in the corner of the room hashed a plan. As he headed to bed, they jumped him, brutally murdering him on the spot. When he didn't appear for check out the next morning, an employee was sent to check on him. They returned a moment later, pale as a sheet and visibly shaken. When the others entered the room, they saw a horrible sight. The room was covered in blood absolutely everywhere. On the floor, the blood had seeped into the floorboards, creating the bloody outline of a headless body. But perhaps even more shockingly, there was no head. Peter Wickerham feared this would be the end of his business. He ordered everything in the room to be taken out and burnt. He also told them to scrub the floor and remove that bloody outline, but no matter how hard they tried, the outline would not fade. Around that same time, people reported seeing the ghostly outline of a headless man peering out the upstairs window. A long time passed and in the 1920s the inn was renovated. In the basement the stone floor was removed to install a new heating system. As they pulled up the old flooring they recoiled in horror at the sight of a complete human skeleton, complete except for the skull. At number 10 we have the lost Dutchman's mine. We all want to be rich so we don't have to worry about money ever again but what are you willing to risk in order to get it? Maybe you will go in search of the missing Dutchman's mine but I'll have you know that might be the last Last time anyone has ever seen you. The tale goes back all the way to the 1800s when the land was fought over by the Native Americans and the settlers. There was a Dutch explorer by the name of Jacob Waltz who wanted to try and strike it rich. He heard there was people mining precious metals and he wanted a piece of the pie. No matter where he dug, there was nothing to be found. He heard about a mountain area that no one had tried digging. He thought he would head over there and give it a shot. However, there was a good reason why no one went looking over there. The Native Americans said the land was cursed and they wouldn't go near the place. But this didn't stop Waltz. He wanted money more than he was afraid of superstition. He went in there and guess what? He found the largest copper deposit the town had ever seen. He was becoming wealthy and other people wanted to know the 
location of this money hole. So they would follow him up into the mountains, but everyone who followed him would disappear, getting lost in the mountains. Some people think it could have just been poor navigation, while other people think it was the curse taking these souls. Then one day Waltz fell to his death when climbing the mountain and the location was lost forever. Will you go in search of the Dutchman's mine? I don't know, it sounds like I just gave you a quest in a video game. At number 9 we have the stranded couple. If you're driving between Ajo, Arizona and Phoenix on the 85, you might see a couple on the side of the road trying to wave you down for help. Once you pull over to help them, you'll look back and they will be gone. The ghost of a couple has been spotted several times, each time trying to get help. Legend says they were a newlywed couple driving through Arizona on their way to celebrate their honeymoon. That's so sweet, I hope nothing bad happens to them. Well, they're ghosts now, so I can promise you something bad happened to them. They crashed into a massive boulder that had rolled onto the road. This killed them both instantly. Now their spirits are stuck on the side of the highway just trying to make it to their honeymoon. That sucks. Oh my god. Imagine being in limbo for your honeymoon for the rest of your life. At number 8 we have the jackalope. Half antelope, half jackrabbit, all mystery. There's been this tale in the southern states for so long. The story of a creature that has the horns of an antelope but the body of a jackrabbit and can move faster than both. In some stories the creature is way larger than any rabbit and could gore a man in seconds. This tale has been disproven many times, but maybe this is just because people are trying to hide the creature from us. Because it's so dangerous, it needs to be kept hidden in some containment facility, because if it gets out, it could destroy an entire city. Or maybe it tastes super good, and all the global elite are hiding it from us because they don't want us to get our hands on the good little jackalope meat. Mm. I want to eat a jackalope. At number 7 we have Too Hot to Handle. We have already covered that Phoenix is in the desert and is a nice place to get away during the winter, especially if you live in Canada. But it might be too hot soon. With the increasing temperatures of climate change, some people speculate that Phoenix will soon become too hot for anyone. So if you choose to live there, you'll literally get fried. Like that myth about being able to fry an egg on the sidewalk? That will become true and it would also become you. Now this is a legend because some people say this is completely false and Phoenix will be fine. But you won't catch me staying there to find out. I absolutely love the warm weather, but I like it to stop before it's cooking my insides. I mean if it does get so hot people will die in the sun, you could go underground and live like mole people and come out at night, and then we'll have a brand new urban legend about the phoenix mole people. Come on, maybe just do it anyways. At number 6 we have the phoenix lights. When an entire city sees some UFOs flying in the sky for over 14 hours, you can bet that will stir up some people. The phoenix lights were seen by so many people that it might be the largest UFO sighting of all time. In 1997 there was a string of 5 lights floating in the air in a V pattern that was hovering over Phoenix. The National Guard claimed that these were just flares and was part of standard training procedure and that there was nothing to be alarmed about. But when you take a look at them I have to say that it does not look like flares at all. Still. She hopes to find out and hopes to keep the discussion going. And it's time Those don't look like flares to me, but what do I know? I work on a YouTube channel and I have zero military experience. Or am I actually an undercover spy? Those are really the only two options. But the Phoenix Lights have never been explained and every year they get brought up. Can the government just open up and tell us that aliens are real already? Come on, just I, I, I'm fine with it. At number 4 we have Phoenix is overrun by poisonous scorpions. That sounds like a perfect place to visit. There's so many scorpions over there you find them in your shoes the next morning and then you die. Well let's straighten some things out. There are scorpions in Phoenix. A lot of the southern states have scorpions and Arizona has the only poisonous scorpion in America. The Arizona bark scorpion. But stay with me there's not an insane amount of scorpions in Phoenix. And it's super rare to die from a scorpion sting. You have a better chance of getting killed by lightning in Arizona than a scorpion sting. So don't let the little pincer bug stop you from checking out the next Cardinals game. The Magoyan Monster. Now I know the Magoyan Rim is like two hours outside of Phoenix, but this monster has legs baby. It could make its way to Phoenix if it wanted to. Also it's impossible to make an urban legends list without including some sort of monster creature, ghost lady, or creature in the lake. That's how it works. I had to do it to him. Now this beast is basically Arizona's Bigfoot. It hangs out in the Magolan Ridge and has been spotted over a hundred times. There's no clear photographic evidence of course. What would be the fun in that? The first sighting dates back to 1908. This thing is said to have massive claws and an orange tint to its fur. It also possibly has some sort of skunk ability to release a stink cloud around it that just is brutal because everyone who's ever come in contact with it says that this thing stinks super bad. Maybe it's just a big hairy dude who chose to live in the forest and now smells bad because he never showers. If you get into monster hunting and you want to track this thing down, it loves sweet things, baked goods and fruit. But 
be careful, this creature is extremely powerful. It's basically a gorilla, but much bigger. And number two, we have Phoenix is the kidnapping capital of America. Well, that settles it. I'm not going over there. The last thing I need is someone to put a sack over my head and then have people cutting off my toes to send them to my family members because they think I have money. I have less than 100K on Instagram. I promise you, I'm not worth it. There's no water in this well. Now, I've read a mix of statistics on this urban legend. There was a case study back in 2008 that said people in Phoenix were getting thrown in the back of painter vans more times than Bill Clinton flew on the Lolita Express. But that study was debunked and now people don't know what to believe. Some people think they're just covering up how many people go missing in Phoenix so it doesn't hurt the tourism. And I don't know what to believe. But if you want to go somewhere hot and fun, you might want to go to Mexico instead. I think it might be safer. And for the number one spot, we have Phoenix is almost out of water. Every five years or so, the story pops up that Phoenix will run out of water soon. This has been a legend since the 70s and has started picking up steam with the climate change crisis. So far, there has never been a time where there's been no water around. But that hasn't stopped the legend from being something that people are constantly worried about. I mean, it makes sense. You live in a desert. If everything goes to hell, you will be the first place to have no water. Phoenix would become some sort of mad Max City with people riding around in makeshift cars gunning each other down for the few liters of water they could find while yelling gasoline. Starting off at number 10 now we have the Clown Graveyard. With a name like that you probably think it's a metaphor for something but the name is literal and the story is tragic. In Forest Park, Illinois lies Woodlawn Cemetery. Some of the graves there are marked by elephant statues. An engraving at the base of one large elephant is inscribed with the words Showman's League of America. All of the graves are marked with the same death date, June 22nd, 1918. On that fateful night, members of the Hagenbeck Wallace Circus were asleep in the rear cars of a train that was passing through the area. At 4 a.m., they stopped in the town of Hammond, Indiana to call an overheated axle box. Little did they know that right behind them, a train driver had fallen asleep at the helm of his empty military train. He missed all the automatic signals and flares that warned him of the stalled train. He smashed right into the wooden circus cars. The survivors tried to scramble out, but soon the train lanterns had ignited the wreckage. It's thought that up to 110 circus employees were killed. They were buried in the mass graves. Many of the victims' names were not even known. So some of the markings have engravings like Baldy, Four Horse Driver, or Unidentified Male. They say that their restless spirits still haunt the graveyard. Apparently, they are also joined with the spirits of some of the circus elephants that died. Locals say that to this day, the sound of phantom elephants can be heard at night. Which I think is a lot creepier than humans. I don't know. Moving on to number nine now, guys. We have the Thunderbirds. I wish this one was about the nice puppet show that I used to watch as a kid, but it's not. The Thunderbirds are creatures that many people have seen in Illinois. Giant birds with wingspans of up to 20 feet. One famous local legend in the town of Alton is that of the Piazza Bird, a name given by the Illinois Native Americans, meaning bird that devours a man. Now that gives you guys a little clue as to why people fear them. Although the legend has existed for hundreds of years, things took a turn in the 1970s. In 1973, Ruth Lowe was cleaning up after her family had dinner in Lawndale, Illinois. The kids were playing outside when she heard a piercing scream and knew it was her son. When she ran outside, she saw two massive birds flying in formation and chasing her son, pecking and clawing at his shoulders. The larger one sunk its claws right into his shirt and lifted him off the ground. Round. Ruth managed to fight them off and release her son, but only after they carried him a distance of over 35 feet. Locals believe that this was a modern day sighting of some Thunderbirds, mythical creatures who have been mentioned in Native American stories for hundreds of years and now seem to be scaring a lot of people in the area. Next number number eight now, we have Bloods Point Road. Drive about an hour and a half northwest of Chicago and you can find Bloods Point Road. It's been the focus of a number of paranormal investigations over the years and not just because of its creepy name. Locals say that as you drive along it, trees begin to look like humans standing guard. Now they say they stretch out in an effort to grab you. You might think that sounds creepy, but they say that the trees are just attempting to warn you of things to come if you choose to continue down that road. Others say that the trees themselves are haunted. The ghosts congregate there. They say that if you're hidden, you can even watch the ghosts moving between the trees. All of this isn't helped by the fact that the road is home to the Bloods Point Cemetery. Let's 
legend says that actual hellhounds guard the cemetery gates. These evil dogs appear out of nowhere and attack visitors before instantly disappearing. On dark nights with a full moon, they've even been known to wander out of the cemetery and down Blood Points Road. Perhaps that's what the trees were warning against. Moving on to number seven now, we have the Mad Gasser of Mattoon. For two weeks in 1934, the residents of Mattoon, Illinois were terrorized by a killer known only as the Mad Gasser. On August 31st, a man called Urban Rafe awoke to a strange smell in his bedroom that made him physically ill. He woke his wife up, who wondered if there might perhaps be a problem with the gas downstairs. When she tried to get up though, she found that she couldn't move her legs. The symptoms went away after a while though, and she found there was nothing wrong with the gas. Nearby, that exact same night, a woman went to check on her daughter, but found that she too was paralyzed from the waist down. The next night, a similar thing happened to another woman. The police began investigating, but found no clues. The local newspapers suggested that there was a madman out in the dark, creeping around and pumping this paralyzing gas into people's homes. He became known as the Mad Gasser. The panic in the town reached such levels that even the FBI got involved, but they too were unable to find a culprit. Reports have died down in the decades since, but some residents are on alert for a copycat Mad Gasser. Coming at number six now, we have the Enfield Horror. In April 1973, residents of Enfield, Illinois were all talking about a creature simply known as the Enfield Horror. On April 25th, a boy was attacked in his backyard by a creature with T-Rex-like arms, short claws, pink eyes, grey slimy skin and three legs. Later, the creature tried breaking into a neighbour's home where it was shot by a man named Henry McDaniel with a 22 calibre pistol. As the media picked up on the story, a news director for WWKI Radio claimed to have actually taped the monster's screams as it ran off. He said he saw the creature cover 50 to 85 feet with just three leaps and then vanish out of sight. The police dismissed the reports and discouraged hunters from trying to find the creature. Others ignored the warnings and began in investigating. Some parallels were found between the creature's description and some similar reports from the nearby town of Mount Vernon. Those reports came from the 1940s, leading some people to believe that this creature appears every 40 to 50 years, which I think means we are due for the return of the Enfield Horror right about now. Moving on to number five now, we have the Murfreesboro Mud Monster. In 1973, a young couple was parked by a desolate river in Murfreesboro, Illinois for a romantic night. Suddenly, a huge, wet, hairy beast just climbed out of the water. It was covered in mud. It let out a piercing roar, which they would later say sounded like an eagle shrieking into a microphone. The couple fled without waiting to find out what it would do to them. For the next two weeks though, the whole town was in panic mode as more and more people had encounters with the huge albino beast which came to be known as the big muddy monster. When police investigated they found huge prints in the ground which seemed to match the size that others had described. When an officer leant down to inspect the print he heard a horrifyingly shrill screech nearby. The police chief of the town said in an interview a lot of things in life are unexplained and this is another one. We don't know what the creature is but we do believe what these people saw was real. Moving on to number four now we have the Chesterfield Witch. Near the town of Arcola in what is now known as Amish country lies the small town of Chesterfield. Its cemetery is said to be home to a witch. Legend says that in life she stood up for the women who were being mistreated in the Amish community. In retaliation they labelled her a witch and actually accused her of worshipping the devil. The community elders banished her. After that nobody heard from her. She just disappeared completely. A while later her body was found in a nearby field. They labelled her death as just down to natural causes and took her to a local funeral home. They put her body on display as a sort of attraction for locals to come and see a real witch. Eventually, after they had their fun, the woman was buried and a tree planted near her grave. In the years since, a deep superstition has grown around that tree. They say that it has bound her spirit to that grave. Legend says that if the tree ever dies, her spirit will be free to seek revenge upon the Amish community who banished her and displayed her body for entertainment. Some say that they've seen her spirit just standing over the grave, patiently waiting for the tree to die. Next up at number two now, we have the Farmer City Monster. In the spring of 1970, three sheep were killed near the town of Farmer City, Illinois. Officials put it down to just wild dogs. Soon after, four teens parked up in a nearby area of the woods. They got the fright of their life when a huge, hairy humanoid with piercing yellow eyes approached the vehicle. Somehow, their flashlights were enough to scare this creature away, and the teens quickly fled the scene. The two boys of the group returned 
returned later though to investigate and again they encountered the creature. This time they noticed a smell. It was nauseating and actually forced them to retreat. The police found an area of flattened foliage which they thought was the creature's nest. Over the next two weeks a number of sightings occurred including one by a police officer and another by some construction workers. They said the creature sprinted out of the woods and crossed the road in front of their van. When the sightings were looked at on a map, some people thought that it showed the creature was on the move, heading northwest. If this was true, perhaps it's moved on. Perhaps it's reached its destination because it hasn't been seen since in the area, but locals say they are ready for its return. And finally at number one now, we have Moon Point Cemetery. This is an old Civil War cemetery which has become an obsession of ghost hunters all over Illinois. It began as a family cemetery for a settler called Jacob Moon, but over the centuries it was eventually used by everyone. Of all the spirits said to haunt this place, one of them is perhaps the most famous, the Hatchet Lady. She's been seen carrying a hatchet while watching over her son's grave. She's also been known to shout at visitors to get out whenever they step too close to the area. Now on top of all that, the graveyard is also said to be home to the ghostly spirit of a young boy. Perhaps it's her son. There's even been sightings of multicolored orbs and light and also the sound of coffin lids opening and closing in the dark. No thank you. Candy. I love candy. Get me a dip and dab and a strawberry lace. Whether we have to say the candy lady of Texas is enough to make me give up caramels for life, which is a shame because caramel such a dream. So the candy lady is said to have been a woman called Clara Crane. She lived in Texas around the turn of the 20th century. She was said to have been married to an older man and the pair had a child called Marcella. Sadly, Marcella was killed in a freak accident and Clara blamed her husband and then went mad, reportedly killing him with poisoned caramel. She was then taken to North Texas Lunatic Asylum but released a few years later. This is when candy started showing up on windowsills luring in kids. Later, a number of kids across the state went missing, and one farmer was said to have found rotten children's teeth in a caramel wrapper on his land. The urban legend goes that the candy lady will start by leaving a kid candy to win their trust, then she'll abduct them and stab them with a fork. I shouldn't laugh, but forks are kind of like the comedy side of utensils, right? From candy lady to donkey lady at number 8. Donkey lady, now I've heard it all. Apparently ye old donkey lady haunts a bridge over Elm Creek in San Antonio, Texas. The origin story of the ghost dates back almost 200 years to the mid 1800s. When settlers were living on the banks of Elm Creek, a husband and wife had a small wooden farmhouse and were making a living with a small number of livestock. One day one of their donkeys or mules was grazing in the area when a young man from the town came across it. This man was not a nice man, but he was a wealthy man. He was the son of an important town leader. The young man teased the donkey and hit it with a stick, to which the donkey fairly responded by biting him. I'd bite someone if they hit me with a stick too. Retaliating, the man started heavily beating the donkey. Hearing their mule being attacked, the couple emerged and told the man to get away, throwing rocks at him for hurting their valuable animal. The man had a bit of Prince Joffrey entitlement moment and he screamed that his father would hear about this and, to be honest, hear about it he did. He brought a bunch of friends to the farmhouse to torch the place. When the husband intervened, he was shot, as were his sons. The wife's dress caught fire and she helplessly watched her loved ones die. As she was engulfed in flames, she screamed running down the road. She began to burn as she threw herself into the creek. Her body was never found, but her wails are said to still be heard along the stretch of the road. If a car stops for too long, it is said that she appears screaming with her arms outstretched on the bridge. Some even report a body falling on the bonnet of the car, but when they stop, there's nothing there. Coming into number six, we have the White Lady of Rio Frio. So the Frio River is a beautiful spot near Rio Frio in Texas. On a summer's day, you may see picnickers hanging out by the water, enjoying the weather. But some say they've had a far spookier experience. Many people that visit the Frio River have reported a strange white mist hovering over the water. Some say it's a strange microclimate, but others cite the story of the Lady of Frio. The story goes that back in the 1900s, a young girl called Maria Juarez was the prettiest girl in the canyon. She was young and had an elder sister whom she loved deeply. Her sister had children with a man called Gregorio who unfortunately cared more about Maria than a sister-in-law. Maria helped raise her sister's children and dreamed that someday she would meet someone, marry them and have kids of her very own. She thought all of her dreams had come true when she met Anselmo, a dashing young man who seemed to return her affections. Sadly, this angered Gregorio who told Maria that he loved her and wanted to be with her. When she rebuffed him because of her sister and Anselmo, 
Anselmo, he shot her through the heart by the lake. Now her spirit is said to haunt the spot to this day. Adding a level of legitimacy to the story, there is an unmarked grave in a Frio cemetery said to belong to Maria, the white lady who died an unmarried virgin. Coming into number 5 we have El Muerto. The El Muerto tale is truly terrifying. Back during the gold rush era, people thought that there was gold to be found in Texas. On top of that, the USA Mexico border was hotly contested around this area, with an area of no man's land between the two countries. In this area, bandits were rife and Texas rangers were around to keep them in check. One ranger, William Bigfoot Wallace, wanted to teach the bandits a lesson after one persistent criminal, known simply as Vidal, stole a bunch of Mustang horses. When he was in court, Bigfoot Wallace and his ranger friends chopped off Vidal's head, sat his body on a horse, attached his hands to the reins, and strung his head to the saddle. This was supposed to teach other would be bandits a lesson not to mess with the Texas Rangers. Some poor sod then had to deal with finding the horse and its deceased cargo, which would be absolutely awful. Despite eventually being taken down from the horse, legend has it that Vidal rides on through the Rio Grande area today, and his ghost is dubbed as El Morto. Coming into number 4 we have the Dancing Devil of El Cameroncito. A dancing Texas urban legend, I am so down for this. Apparently the Dancing Devil is local only to El Cameroncito, so ladies of other towns, no worries if a man is asking you to dance, you're probably safe. Ladies in Cameroncito though, watch out. So basically a legend has it that in the 1970s, a man in a dapper suit would ask beautiful ladies to dance with him. While they didn't find him beautiful, they felt compelled to dance. As he danced, women would be swept up. One day, a woman noticed the man she was dancing with had hooves for feet and that everyone near them was staring in horror. Realising she was dancing with the devil, she ran away. The devil however remained. Now I always keep my demons in my dancing shoes. Coming into number 3, we have Goatman. Goatman, 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 Goatman. Fun to say, fun to talk about. There are a couple of legends surrounding the Goatman of Old Alton Bridge in Denton County. The bridge is locally dubbed Goatman's Bridge and some say that is because there is a goat like demon that haunts the nearby forest. But others turn to a more elaborate tale of a local goat farmer. Oscar Washburn was a black goat farmer who was known for being an honest businessman, and he was a well liked member of the community. Unfortunately, a successful black man caught the attention of the KKK, who was said to have abducted him in August 1938. Reportedly, they tied a noose around his neck and threw him over the old Alton Bridge into the river below. When they went to bring up his body, they found that the noose was empty. Frustrated, the clan went to his house and slaughtered his wife and children. Washburn's body was never found, but a lot of paranormal enthusiasts will tell you that if you drive out over the bridge at night without your headlights on, the old goat man will be standing on the other side to greet you. Some also report being touched or grabbed by a spirit, and others say there are weird flashing lights in the nearby forest. Coming into number 2, we have the ghost of Fort Phantom Hill. Fort Phantom is one of the most well preserved historic sites in Texas, with original architecture dating back to the mid 1850s. Fort Phantom was built as a safe stop for immigrants headed to the Californian gold fields. The story behind the name of Phantom Hill seems to be twofold. On the one hand, the fort is said to look really high up on a plateau from afar, but when you get close, it looks level, so it disappears like a phantom. The other story is that one night while a sentry was keeping watch, he fired on a Native American who was on the hill. When he went to go and investigate, he didn't find a body. When the team at the whole fort went out to look for a band of natives, they couldn't find any evidence of them ever being nearby. This ghost on the hill is said to re-emerge every now and then, confusing those who watch from the garrison. Finally coming into number 1, we have one of the most well known Texas urban legends ever, we have the Houston Batman. So first I was like, Batman? Hell yes, get me there. But then I delved further into this legend and I realised that they don't mean like the superhero, no no no. The Houston Batman is also known as the Houston Horror and is a winged creature that has regularly been sighted in Houston, Texas. Now this creature is a bit like the Mothman of the Mothman prophecies and I don't like a big moth. The story of the winged menace dates back to 1953 when a woman and her neighbours were sitting on their porch in East 3rd Street, Houston. 23 year old housewife Hilda Walker said she looked up over the lawn and saw the shadow of a huge moth. When she looked up, she saw something huge then fly into a pecan tree. Her and her neighbours thought that the monster was around six and a half feet tall, although they weren't totally sure what they'd seen. 14 year old Judy Mayer, who was also sat on the porch, screamed in fear as she got a square on look at the monster. He was described as 
a man, but with wings, huge, huge wings, and a weird, strange yellow haze around him. Mrs. Walker reported the incident to the police and spoke to local news outlets. The Batman slash Mothman may have been spotted once again by Houston Belair theatre workers in the 1990s, and the legend lives on today. Some suspect a government cover up is at play, as vigilantes seeking the Batman discovered that some years after the initial incident, Mrs. Walker's neighbourhood was raised to make way for a new part of the interstate. Alright, coming in at number 10, we have Lechuza. Ooh, I love a good owl, but this one is not your average mouse catcher. Lechuza is a shape shifting witch who flies through the night hunting for prey. While in flight, she may look like an owl. When a Lechuza is stopped, they have bird bodies and human faces, so basically a lot like a harpy. The women seem to be hybrid monsters, as in their human lives, they were said to have sold their soul to the devil, who gave them intense magical powers in exchange for their souls. How do you know you're in the presence of a Lechuza? Well, they'll let you know by a series of whistling and baby noises. Those who try and investigate what the noises are will likely become dinner for the owly she witches. Not great. Coming in at number 9, we have the Chubacabra. Ah, the legend of the Chubacabra. This one isn't constricted to Texas alone. The Chubacabra story first sprang up in Puerto Rico. It is said to be a blood sucking monster from the deep that attacks animals and drinks the blood of livestock, especially goats, which is why the creature's name translates to goat sucker in Spanish. Anyway, in Texas, reports of the Chubacabra were rife in the year 2007 when a woman named Phyllis Canyon reported seeing being one of the blood sucking monsters at her ranch in South Texas. She also reportedly found a number of chickens with their throats torn open. This sparked a whole chubacabra panic, and the legend of the beast was firmly consolidated in the Lone Star State law. Coming into number eight, we have the Chinese Cemetery. There is a strange urban legend surrounding a seven foot tall ghost and her lover at the Lona China Cemetery in Texas. This isn't just your classic ghost haunting in a graveyard, except actually, I guess it is, only there's a freakish tall ghost. Mm. The story goes that a man wanted to run away with his lover of Chinese descent, but he was forbade by his great grandfather who owned the cemetery. The issue here was an issue of race. The man was Anglo Hispanic, but his grandee didn't want him mixing. I bet that old racist isn't pleased that the cemetery is now called the Chinese cemetery. Hey. Anyway, both the ghost of the tall woman and the man are said to roam the cemetery at night looking for one another, but sadly, they never quite meet, which is depressing. Apparently the female has been known to reach out and touch you, thinking that you might be the lost love. Since shivers up my spine. <laughs> Coming in at number 7, we have the legend of Midget Mansion. Not the most politically correct name, but it seems that Midget Mansion is the name this urban legend is best known by in San Antonio. It seems that the house in question is a mansion with low hanging fixtures and ceilings custom built for a family of small people. A husband and a wife and their normal sized children took up residence in this home. The father was said to be a respected businessman in the 1920s and was well liked in the community, who found him to be a novel addition. It seems sadly the man went mad one day and murdered his entire family. What with the murders and the odd size of the home, nobody really wanted to buy it, so it fell into disrepair. It seems that the ghostly sounds emanating from the building and strange shadows lurked for many, many years. A lot of people who went to the abandoned house felt a malicious presence. From my research, it seems that the old house has finally been pulled down in favour of condos. However, the ghostly presence, the trauma of the family left behind, is apparently still rife in folklore. Coming into number six, we have El Kukui. Am I saying this right, Texas? Let me know, because I'm just a humble British gal who has no idea really. So these urban legends come around so much, I honestly feel like in every country and within that, a lot of provinces and states have their own version. El Kukui is a Texan bogeyman, but worse. Apparently. Now, the legend describes the beast as male, small, humanoid with glowing red eyes. Al Kukui hides in closets and under beds and comes for naughty children in the night. While this does seem like your classic boogeyman stuff, it seems that there have been some reported sightings of El Kukui over the years. Now, this leads me to think that actually, maybe there is something more to this urban legend after all. Coming into number three, we have Demon's Road. It just isn't an urban legend video without a spooky haunted road. Is it? No. 
It's not. In Huntsville, Texas, there is a stretch of road called Bowden Road, although locals will tell you that it's called Demon's Road. Why? More because of the demonic things that have reportedly happened along it. Oh, and there's a cemetery at the end of the road, which doesn't really help matters. A whole bunch of Huntsville residents have had weird experiences along the road or seen strange things, but this isn't just your average haunted road. It seems that oftentimes spectres will follow people home. One popular story associated associated with Demon's Road is that a woman was visiting the cemetery at the end of the road when she saw a man lurking. Now, the man was acting a bit weirdly, he was pacing up and down, but she didn't pay him much attention. After that, as she was journeying home, she thought she saw the same man walking on the road, but once again, she just ignored it. When she got home, however, she thought she saw the same man staring at her from her bathroom mirror while she was in the shower. She screamed, he disappeared, and she never saw him again. Creepy. Number 8. Theater Center This would make horror movies so much better. I imagine you get to watch a movie about ghosts in a place that's actually haunted by ghosts. Amazing. The theater center is apparently haunted by the ghost of an usher. The usher was killed in the theater by a jealous boyfriend when he was stabbed. On the bright side, this would mean you would get free movies for eternity. I mean, there's way worse places you could die. Imagine if you died in a paint store and then you had to haunt this place for the rest of time. The most exciting part of your day would be when they bring in the new fall colors. Wow, there's 11 shades of brown. Exciting. Number seven, Civil War Ghost. I guess the benefits of being a ghost after a war is you get to see how everything happened. You're either like, I can't believe what the world has come to, or you're like, man, I was really the bad guy this whole time. Over on the Thompson Island Bridge in San Marcos, Texas, a Civil War ghost has taken post and he will never leave. The backstory on this ghoulie is he pops up whenever a war is happening. So for America, that means this guy's working overtime. Also, it's said he can't leave because he made a promise to his brother that he'll make it home alive no matter what. I think it's time this guy took an L and just moved on to the afterlife. Number five, Marfa Lights. We're jetting over to the little town of Marfa, Texas. In this little old country town, there's some pretty weird happenings appearing right in the sky. The Marfa lights are these balls of light that appear out of nowhere, like someone floating in midair is lighting off an M80. There has been so much speculation on what it could be. Some people think it's spirits floating around doing a little dance for the people watching. Just because you're dead doesn't mean you don't want attention. Other people think that it could be aliens. They think that they travel between this spot in Marfa and wherever these aliens have come from. They can use this spot to take samples of the earth, like a little school trip. But scientists have said that it's just balls of gas lighting up in the air. Boring scientists always ruining our fun. But hey, there's still hope that they're just trying to cover up some actual alien activity. Huh. Number two, Bigfoot. Yes, I know Bigfoot was originally spotted in North Carolina, but there have been many sightings of the possible missing link in the Lone Star State. I mean, if you're a Bigfoot, I can't imagine you believe in borders. You just kind of go anywhere you please whenever you want and try to not get shot and make sure you're always out of focus. Although I do think that Texas would be one of the worst places for a Bigfoot to travel. They're covered in hair and Texas is almost always hot. There's cowboys and trackers all over the place who would probably love to hunt you down, and there's so many guns. I would definitely put Bigfoot on the list of things that are totally fine to shoot on sight. But the old ape man is really popular in Texas. There's even a group in Beeville called the Bee County Bigfoot Research Group that is dedicated to finding out the truth about Bigfoot. I wonder if they get paid for that if they just do it out of the goodness of their hearts. At number eight, we have the Sons of Herman Hall. This old hall is a nice place to have a low key wedding or throw one of those hall parties. Are those still a thing? They were cool when I was in high school. I'm not cool anymore. But if you choose to have any sort of event at this hall, you're gonna have plenty of unexpected guests. There have been tons of apparitions that have shown up while people are still partying in the building. People have seen couples dancing together, kids playing, and all sorts of scary ghostly things. But the ghosts always seem like they're having a great time. Many of the ghosts are dressed in their Sunday best, like they're heading to a big event. If you're gonna be a ghost crashing a wedding, you can at least dress like you're supposed to be there. That's a very nice thing for them to do. I wonder who would be the last one dancing. It would be pretty hard to out samba someone who doesn't have a heartbeat. And number seven, we have the Dolphus Hotel. You know, I think if a big expensive hotel has a ghost inside it, 
it almost makes it more fancy. You know, I think if a big expensive hotel has a ghost inside it, it's almost more fancy. The owners are like, yeah, this hotel is so nice, people want to spend eternity here. If you agree with this idea, then the Adolphus Hotel must be one of the fanciest hotels in all of America because it is super haunted. The most famous ghost is that of a woman in white, the ghost of a bride who never made it to the altar. Her ghost has been seen all over the hotel, but mainly on the 19th floor. She tends to stick to number 19 because that's the floor where she took her own life on the day of her wedding. She hung herself in one of the rooms. Not only can you see the well-dressed ghost floating around, but you can also hear her. Some people have reported the sounds of a crying woman from empty rooms. On top of the deceased bride-to-be, there are some other ghosts who will walk around the hotel whispering in people's ears and even one that plays the piano in the ballroom. At number 6 we have Flagpole Hill. If you want to visit this place, you better have car insurance because your car is going to get bashed up. Flagpole Hill seems like a place where you could just display your patriotism and then go home. But that's not the case. There's a bunch of ghosts there who want to ruin your expression of loyalty because the punk phantoms will start throwing rocks at your car. People have reported rocks being thrown at their car when no one is standing there. Like, dude, I just got this sunfire. Like, are you kidding me? You know what this baby means to me? It's crimson red. Crimson red sunfire. So, man. Maybe if you go to Dallas, you can show your American pride by going to the Cowboys game and skip the jerk offs who throw stones at your car. Some people think that the ghost comes from a nearby house where a man committed suicide. At number five, we have the Granddad Theater, an old closed down theater. Of course, this place has some ghosts kicking around inside it. There have been loads of reports coming from this place. The most famous is about how the door to the projector room opens and closes on its own. It's not like that haunted door from the Los Angeles urban legends list that would crush people to death. That's probably my favorite haunted door of all all time. But this one is still pretty creepy. Now where have these ghosts come from? Well, apparently the whole place was built on an Indian burial ground, which seems like an old trope. I don't even know if I believe this one. But I'm here to bring you guys what I have learned, so it's up to you to decide whether or not you believe it. At number four, we have Mary of the Comb Creek Trail. What are the top three things that make ghosts? Brides who die on their wedding day, people who fall victim to some sort of horrible curse or accident, and of course, children. I would say child ghosts are some of the most creepy. I think their little hands are all still sticky in the afterlife. Well, the sticky handed ghost of a young girl named Mary haunts the Comb Creek Trail. If you're walking or driving down the trail, you might see her ghost standing by watching you as you pass. There have been a few photos of the spirit and it seems like she's not alone. In most of the photographic evidence, you can see what looks like to be some sort of entity standing behind her. Could this other phantom be the reason that Mary went missing? Maybe this monster grabbed her and took her to the other side or maybe she was kidnapped and her kidnapper died alongside her who knows